apply it. Go for it. Um, can you guys hear Derek and Ray when they talk? Is that, uh, do we have them talking at least? <laughs> so be answering mystery questions from nowhere. We've got somebody in the chat saying, oh my gosh, Derek. So there's somebody excited to see you play, Derek. How do you like that? Great to have fans. All right. Um, now my mic's probably way too loud, so let me try and bring it down. Bring it down. All right. Well, um, everybody, we rely on you to let us know if you can hear the three of us or, you know, which one of us you can hear. <laughs> and we'll try and fix the sound as quick as we can with that. Um, so, Derek, how long have you wanted to play in the Pro Chess League? How long have you been waiting for this match? Cool. All right, now they're telling me that they can't hear anyone except for me, so that's awesome. Um, let's see. Settings, output, audio. Let's try some default speakers, apply it. All right, Derek, tell everybody your favorite opening as a, basically as a mic check. Um, uh, Nidorf, I guess. Nidorf. All right. Not that you're going to play today. I mean, your opponent would only have 30 seconds if they were stream sniping anyway. Yeah. Anybody hear? Uh, anybody hear Derek's favorite opening? That's a good choice, by the way, Derek. That's uh, yeah. Bobby Fisher's, Gary Kasparov's, Bashila Grov's, and my favorite opening. Um. All right. So. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, your match actually starts in three and a half minutes, so I'm going to let you go in one minute whether or not people have heard you. Hopefully, hopefully people have heard from you. Ah, yes, they're saying that you're a legend. All right, nice. <laughs> um, okay, so anything that you can recommend to people when they're nervous before a chess tournament to get rid of the nerves? You got any tips? Um, just relax a little bit, I guess. Don't be too tense. and Yeah, just try to enjoy the game. Okay. Do you think giving an interview in front of 3,000 people is a good way to relax? Um, probably not. But, but as yeah, long as they can't hear you, you could yeah. say anything. <laughs> All right. In the interest of letting you get set for your um, match, we're going to have a super brief interview and let you go get set. Okay. But um, good luck to you. Sorry for cutting off your audio. And, uh, you know, hopefully things go really well for you and uh, your surfers today. Okay, thank you. Right, good luck, Derek. Thank you. All right. So, um, all right. Let's see. Now it's just you and me, Ray, and uh. So my uh. Um, <laughs> is my sound working? I hope so. I sure hope so. Um. So over here, let's see. Nope, that's not gonna do it. All right, so over here I've got some slides that are showing people the format. We've got games which will be underway within two minutes. Uh, but the first thing that everybody's going to see is going to be a match between St. Louis and San Diego, the two fan clubs. Uh, we've got confirmation to hear you. Yes. Um, so the first thing you all are going to see is this match. Um, I'm being told my mic is hot. Okay. Mine, yours, I don't know. Um, Ray, uh, tell us what's the time control for the two game match? Like, if somebody jumps into this match between like St. Louis and San Diego, what time control are they looking at? Uh, I believe the time control is two rounds and two. That is correct. Nailed that question. Um,. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, well, we can already see tons of people here signed in for both teams. And the music is playing over the slides right now. Great.
So I'll switch over here to slides that I can control without music. Um, all right, and I'm gonna turn my mic down a little bit so that it balances better with yours. Apparently a hot mic is a mic that's just too loud. I thought it'd be a mic that was live, but. Um, all right, so we got two rounds of 10 and two coming up here. Um, let's see how many people have shown up for San Diego. Tons of people, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. The San Diego team has shown up today. Last week, um, I, I imagine you didn't see last week's match, but last week, the San Diego and San Francisco teams played like, you know, about a 15 board match and mm -hmm. St. Louis and Chengdu were both like f many time finalists in the, uh, in the league. They had like 50 player teams. Okay. So it was possible, it was possible that the archbishops would outnumber San Diego by a large margin today. But San Diego has so many players, I can't even count it easily. I would say it looks like they only have three players less than St. Louis. And uh, it looks like matches are getting underway as well. So yeah. we're going to go to our main scene. And I'm going to quickly fix this. Do, 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 do. I'm just quickly, I'm just quickly making your face nicer while E4 gets played in the first game here between Derek and um, and Verusian Akobian. It's a tough first opponent for Derek. How did they get their their ratings? <laughs> How did they get their 2200 ratings? So the rule, so the rule for these matches is that you're if you're over 2200 in rapid, you can't play. Uh huh. Um, and the teams are allowed to pick one member of the team to play uh, for their team. So, like, for example, you know, the windmills, if you were playing, only one of you could play. You couldn't have you and Nizhnik and, you know, Shimonov, like, all playing the same week. Um, mm -hmm. And the way one of you would be able to play is you would play on the team account, which is automatically set to 2199. And that ensures that you get paired against the first board of the other team. So San Diego Surfers, Derek is Derek at 2199. And St. Louis Archbishops, that's Verusian at 2199. Yeah, I, okay, thanks. And um, <laughs> Var has, uh, he's played a line that he, I remember he used to play all the time. I don't think he plays as much anymore. But I remember back when he used to play a lot of open tournaments in the U.S., he was... He was playing this uh, Pyrrhic with c6, queen, a5 all the yep. time. I, I, I remember seeing that too. Yeah, he actually played it, I think, I think at least once, probably at least twice uh, actually against me. One time in, um, in my first US championship, another time in just an open tournament, and uh, I think he won both games. <laughs> okay. It was a good, it was a good like anti-kid open tournament weapon. Yeah. Yeah, and um, I mean, he he did pretty well against me back in. I mean, this was like ten years ago. <laughs> so. Um, Since you were the kid in the open. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, I yeah, I've also seen him play this. So I wonder if Derek had any idea that this was a possibility. I wonder if Derek is at all prepared for this opening. Uh, based on the time, it doesn't seem likely that he was very well prepared. Also, yeah, when he played knight f3 on move 6, yeah, then e takes d4, knight d4, queen b6. I mean, VAR played this very quickly, but I've, I don't remember seeing this position. So obviously VAR knew this idea, but um, it's yeah. possible that Derek prepared knight f3 but wasn't wasn't aware of this queen b6 idea hitting the knight yeah that was definitely the first point where derek had a thought was what he wanted to do about this knight b3 bishop e3 bishop e2 in the end he played bishop e2 and he thought a little bit as well as on this choice to go e5 but um my first thought would be that he's made a pretty good choice and um that giving black this isolated d5 pawn and being maybe like a tempo ahead on development for white that Derek's actually figured out the opening okay so far. 
Yeah, he should definitely be doing okay. I expect, um, well, probably he can just castle here. Um, I mean, there there is the pin on the the d4 knight with the queen on b6. But mm -hmm. if black attacks it with, let's say, knight c6, there's always c3. So you're never going to lose the knight by force. And right. black has to be, I mean, maybe black could try to, you know, take the e5 pawn at some moment, but... He has to be really worried about his uh, development. His king is still in the center. Right. He could, he could try to win the e5 pawn, but or he could play bishop c5 and try to win a pawn on d4. Mm -hmm. But in either case, he's never going to win a piece, so at most he'll win a pawn at great effort, and white should have some decent play out of that. Yeah, so I would guess probably if Derek castles, um, Var would probably just play bishop g7 instead of putting the bishop on c5. Wow, newsflash, within four and a half minutes, San Diego Surfers have scored the first point in this match. They now lead oh, wow. <laughs> by uh, by a score of 1-0. to zero. But this is going to be out of a huge number of games. I haven't yet counted it up, how many boards there are. But um, And so each game counts equally, correct? Yes. Yes, no extra points for being the first board, no fewer points for being the bottom board. Um yeah in um yeah in derek's game against var again after bishop e3 var played bishop g uh knight c6 i think i think the reason he played he didn't play bishop g7 there is with the bishop on e3 there's ideas of um knight f5 And if mm -hmm. uh, if black gives a check on let's say queen a5 check or queen b4 check, it's met by bishop d2. Oh, and sorry, you're talking earlier. Yeah, just one move after bishop e3. After bishop e3, if black played bishop g7, then bishop there was knight f5. Then knight f5 would come, yeah. And that becomes unpleasant immediately. Yeah, very unpleasant. <laughs> Good call. All right, so after bishop e3, yeah, you could even imagine move black having to spend another tempo moving the queen here. I guess he's hoping that if he has to move his queen, he's going to move it to b2. So he plays knight c6 first, and then after castles, um, bishop c5. Okay, so now he doesn't have to run with his queen. Mm -hmm. And now... Yeah, c3 looks forced, and I guess is whether Var wants to take, try to risk taking the e5 pawn, or if he just wants to get his king, king out of the center and castle. Oh, he took b2. So Var is, is not afraid. Um, yeah. I figured he was picking between which pawn he wanted to pick. So yeah, now... Hmm. After queen b2, now c3 is also hanging, and c3 is actually a very important pawn because if black has to play queen takes c3, then not only is the bishop on e3 hanging, but now the knight on d4 loses its... its uh, most stable defender, the c3 pawn, and so that knight is also um, going to be very loose. So yeah. Maybe this is uh, working out for VAR. Yeah, it was the, I would guess that it's going to be very concrete. Uh, hard to just glance at the position and know for sure if it's going to work out or not, yeah? Yeah, well, I'm trying to, trying to find ideas for white, but... So far, I haven't found anything very convincing. Okay. I guess if there's nothing convincing, that would kind of answer the question in a way. <laughs> he, you know, he could try something like, um, yeah, rook b1, which he just played. Queen takes c3, and then he can play rook to b3 to protect the bishop on e3. Mm-hmm. But... There, I mean, there's queen a5, of course, but is is something like, I don't know, queen takes e3? Is that even a consideration? 
and then bishop takes d4. That looks that looks playable. If things were bad for black, that would at least be a bailout. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's good enough to get an advantage for black there's or also, much of an advantage. There's also that similar idea with like queen takes d4, bishop takes d4, knight takes d4. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, St. Louis is coming roaring back. They've already ripped off four points um here so yeah one two three four five six seven eight nine yeah if if Varb does play queen a5 then i mean he has to consider the idea of rook b5 yep and if he wants to not repeat the position he has to put his queen on a3 there mm -hmm. and um so then if rook b3 i guess he could try to <laughs> just take the a2 pawn. in theory his queen could hide on a2 eventually to to escape this rook's attention yeah but after let's say after queen a5 rook b5 queen a3 he's got to be really careful um I guess it might be working. I was thinking at first about rook takes c5, because if you mm -hmm. took the rook back on c5, there's ideas of knight f5, this knight f5 discovery again, now that the queen is there, and now the bishop, now the um, bishop on e3 hitting the queen, and the knight d6 check coming. Looks very, very dangerous. Yeah, I mean, it wins the f7 pawn, which uh, should mean that, that the floodgates are open, pretty much. Yeah. So... But after rook takes c5, um, black... Fortunately for black, he's also hitting the bishop on e3, so he could take that instead. Mm -hmm. And uh, so everything yeah. works out for him there. That'll more than but, save him. But Var has uh, been thinking for a little bit. I'm sure he's thinking about, like, queen takes d4. I think he's seriously considering queen takes d4. Um, maybe that, that might be better than queen takes e3, because either way you're going to get a rook in a piece for the queen. But here you're trying to leave yourself with um, the dark squared bishop instead of having to give up the bishop for the rook. And here you're trying to give up the knight for the rook and mm. keep your bishop on c5, which could help you control the dark squares around your king. Yeah, it would be nice to have that. But let's just actually put that position on the board for a second for our fans. I'll play king h1 for white after knight takes mm -hmm. d4. And then maybe knight b3, a takes b3. I mean, I could take with the queen or pawn, doesn't really matter. But let's just put this on the board and like talk about how you would evaluate something like this. Um, how would you look at this and decide if you wanted to play this or not? Um, well, f I would try to evaluate this position and then, well, then evaluate the queen a5 move. Um, probably this is... I mean, this version is better than queen e3, so I would probably just not consider that one too in depth. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that position after knight takes b3, a takes b3. In general, it's it's good for black. The material count you have a rook, a bishop, and two pawns, which is more than enough material for the queen. And your bishops are also quite good. Uh, concretely, you do have to like, watch out for a few things. Um, especially the d5 pawn is hanging. So yeah. you'd love castle king side, but unfortunately then white can play queen takes d5. So If white plays queen takes d5, that's enough to turn the evaluation. Yeah, I mean, if white gets that pawn, um, white, should be, white should be at least fine. Mm -hmm. Then you can play bishop c4, try to put pressure on f7. So okay. probably he was considering bishop e6 instead of castle. That's probably what he would have been calculating. Right. And then on bishop and, b5, he can go tuck his king through f8 to g7. And yeah, he could try to play king f8, put his bishop on e7, king on g7, and claim that his king is safe. I think a lot of our viewers aren't quite going to believe you, but you would say the dark squared bishop, rook, and two pawns is a little bit better than the queen. With no particular, if there's no particular oh, yeah. thing going on for either player, you'd rather have that collection than have the queen. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the queen, <laughs> the queen is a very strong piece, but that's that's a lot of material. And since all of Black's pawns, all of Black's pieces look quite safe as long mm -hmm. as he's able to complete his king development. Um, so I'm in general, 
I would prefer black's position. So I'm realizing that that means that queen takes b3 would have been a lot better than a takes b3 because you'd have a dual threat of queen d5 and queen b5 check. Uh-huh, that's, yeah, that's and a good point. That might not give black any way to keep the d5 pawn. But I see that Vars moved, so let's see what he did. Queen a5, rook b5, queen a3. All right, so mm -hmm. it, he's planning to hide on a2, you think, Ray? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Derek did go rook b3, and now I, yeah, as far as I can tell, there's not any, any problem with taking on a2. Um, and if queen a4, there's bishop b5. So unless he just wants to repeat, which I'm sure he doesn't want to do, uh, yeah, his idea is to take on a2, which he just played. Okay. Um, so bishop b5 is played. That was a lot of action. They're down to two and a half minutes for Derek and four minutes for Var. Um, so we're going to quickly pop over to another game before this gets into the time scramble, and then we'll be back. But um, one important thing we've got going on with the summer series is that it's really supposed to be focused on uh, on fans. And so fans can play and fans can also like blog, they can stream, they can, you know, analyze their games, they can play for an audience. And uh, we've got two streamers going today. One is Gold Dust Tori, who we saw last week, and another is Andrea Botez here. Um, she's Mobamba604, and she's won her first game for the San Diego Surfers and is um, playing her second game now. Um, against Chesser, and uh, you know you can watch her. You can watch her stream. You can see what the perspective is of a player, of about your rating, perhaps depending on who you are in the audience. But you know, you can pick a streamer of a rating maybe similar to yours and watch what their experience is like throughout the summer series. And uh, also, you all should know that if you do this stuff, you could be you know, fan of the split, so to speak. The The summer series is split into four different divisions, and every three weeks, there's a $250 cash prize for the best fan. Um, and uh, best fan, that means, you know, playing in a lot of matches. That means, you know, either streaming or blogging or providing some kind of pro chess league related content or experience that's exciting for other people. Uh, so you know check out check out these other these other streamers but also you know consider doing this yourself what do you think of uh her opening here ray in uh gold story or um mobamba? uh i'm on mobamba right now okay um well it looks like she played the the london mhm mm and yeah. And I think knight h5 was a, a good move by black, very typical in um, well, any type of queen's gambit type structure. Um, when there's a bishop out, you try to play knight h5, or sometimes when you're white and black has the bishop on f5 and knight h4, mm -hmm. and there's no way to go back with the pawn on e3, so it has to go back to g3, so it's, it's trapped there. Um, and you get to win that bishop for the knight, which is, I mean, theoretically it's an equal trade, but um, usually, usually you would prefer the bishop slightly in this position. So it's definitely a, a good idea for black. And and then Chester nine two six played a very enterprising move g five and yeah. g four immediately <laughs> continuing the attack. Um, That's a lot of enterprising moves in a row, huh? Sorry, what did you say? Oh, I said that's a lot of enterprising moves in a row, huh? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, G5 it makes some sense against space, but the question, the question you have to ask yourself if you're when you're considering G5 is where is my king going to go in the future? Because you don't want to leave your king in the center for the whole game. Mm -hmm. And um, in general, in like... Queen's Gambit, you don't want to castle your king on the queen side. You've already played d5, already played c5. You have some 
air in front of your king over there. So normally, black would castle kingside, but now that you've played g5, you've also weakened your kingside a lot and notice that the rook on h1 and queen and c2 are both on the h7 pawn, so it becomes yeah. very difficult to try to castle that way. So yeah, they're totally g5, running. Yeah, instead of g5, um, the first move that comes to my mind would have been e5, just um, challenging the center, um, putting pressure on the d4 pawn, mm -hmm. and probably white would have to, have to take on e5, and then knight takes e5, and now black has those nice pawns in d5 and c5, um, and so he has better control of the center, and also since he played knight h5, he has two bishops, so I would say black doing quite well there yeah i think um i think if chesser watches the the vod of this after playing this game um he's gonna like that suggestion of yours of e5 because i think that's sufficiently aggressive for his tastes and uh you know the point that he's got the dark square bishops and now he wants to you know break open some dark squares in the center will probably really appeal to him so next time next time chesser you can play e5 instead of running this g pawn uh, but it certainly created an interesting position here. And now we're going to pop back to uh, to Derek and Var and uh, watch their time scramble. Derek's down to 36 seconds. Var has hmm. a minute. And it looks like eventually Var did some version of trading in the queen, huh? Yeah, it looked like his queen, his queen was in some trouble. So he decided to, he did to ah. give it up in the end. So he grabbed that A pawn, but then after rook f2, still decided his queen was just stuck. I mean, maybe Derek had a queen a5, bishop takes c6. Uh, I do. Oh, just knight c6 is enough, yeah. Yeah, and take on c5, and the rook on f8 will be hanging. So Var traded things in, but ended up without his dark squared bishop. And now, now it's intense. The A pawn is hard to stop, so Derek's really looking for checkmate. Yeah, Var's uh, rook on a7 is doing an amazing job of defending that whole rank, but especially defending, yeah, the h7 pawn in case white ever played rook h4, and also it can block on either g7 or f7 in case white tries to sacrifice his rook on g6. So that rook is doing an amazing job, and it also supports the a pawn, allows him to play a3, a2, and make a queen. But... Um, yeah, probably he's calculating if he can just play a3, which uh, looks like he can do. I think yeah. Yeah, sacrifice is incoming, but king f8, and again, he's going to block with checks with his rook on g7, f7, try to run his... Uh... Oh, try to run his king away, but actually queen h6, yes, great move. Now the king e7, there's queen d6 mate. Yeah. So he has to try rook g7, and now yep. queen h8... King f7, queen h5. Oh, no, he flagged. He flagged. I think in the line you were saying that he would eventually get away. These games start up again immediately. But um, So queen h8, king f7, queen h5, queen h5 king e7. e7. And um, he could still he can still continue something like, let's say, queen h4 check. Uh-huh. King d7. Yep. And um, queen, let's say queen f6. Right. So hitting the rook on g7 and also threatening queen d6 check mate. Um, black would move the rook from e8 somewhere to protect his rook on g7 and give his king a square on e8 to hide from the check on d6. So maybe yeah. black was still going to escape eventually, but um, definitely there was still there are still some some chances there yeah 45 and mobamba whose game we'd checked out before that game actually ended in a quick checkmate for white um oh, wow. precisely because of what you were saying ray that the king had mm -hmm. air on the king side and the queen side and then you said in general the king doesn't like hanging out the whole game in the center um it ended up hanging out in the center for a very short game queen b3 attacked b7 and d5 and uh, queen c6 would run into bishop b5 Mm -hmm. So, yeah, queen b3 was a, a very good move, and then black is probably just in a lot of trouble after queen b3. Yeah, so brought the king up there and checkmated him. And uh, with that, uh, 
Mobamba, Ms. Botez, managed to add two points to the Surfers fan club score. They now have 13 versus 20 for St. Louis. Um, and uh, now let's see, Verusian's got white. Here. Yeah, I should mention that um, <laughs> I think VAR is going to be pretty used to these time scrambles already because earlier today there was a, a blitz tournament at St. Louis University, which oh. he, he played in where the time control was three minutes plus two second increment. And it was a, a really strong double round robin blitz tournament. I was also playing, which is why I know about it. <laughs> and, uh, and so there were a lot of time scrambles. I played VAR in the first round and both of our two games were, were going to <laughs> down to the two second increment. So um, he's already warmed up. So he's well warmed up for this. Fair enough. And uh, last week he also represented St. Louis and he won the knockout phase, which is what will follow this match. Um, so he's already, he's already won the four player knockout once last week um, in his, in his match against uh, Chengdu, he won one game and lost one game. So he went one and one in the match, but in the knockout, it was uh, he had the advantage of the white white pieces because there are so many St. Louis fans, and uh, he won he won both games with white. Um, huh? What do you think of his opening here? Um. Yeah, it's a little bit unusual. Yeah. I You see a lot of E4 and a lot of C5. I mean, those are normal space-grabbing moves. But I don't know if I've ever seen B6 and F3 both break the opponent's pawn chain at its sort of strongest point, its head instead of its base. Is the strongest point called the head? I don't, <laughs> I don't even know for sure. I know that the base is called the base. The, the base is called the base. Um, yeah, the one in the front, I guess, is the, the head. That makes sense. Okay. So, so Nimzovich said to attack the pawn structure at its base, you know, 10 million masters following him all agreed to some extent, you know, it's desirable. Um, but this is weird. Two pawn structures challenged at the head. I guess it should mean that C5 could be weak for black and E4 could be weak for white. But right now with where the pieces are, I don't see that happening. In theory, that's what the structure looks like, but... Yeah, well, I think well, what they did is very logical. You're right. They both did make a lot of um, breaks. They both created a pawn chain. Black had the B7 through E4 pawn chain. White had the F2 through C5 pawn chain, um, which were both clamping down the opponent's positions, which is why both of them decided to try to get rid of the, the head of that pawn chain to... Um, well, just to give themselves some more space, because that those pawns are taking away a lot of space um, in their territory, limiting the scope of their pieces. So b6 was a logical move, and you're right. After b6 and white taking, now c5 um, does become a potential weak square in black's position. So, for instance, if white can play something like knight b3 to c5 in the future, that would be a very nice outpost for, for white's knight. So what black would ideally want to do i think is um or one option is to, to play c5 himself mm -hmm. and further break down white's pawn chain and um get rid of that that weak square and c5. white just played e4 which is sort of the symmetrical idea of what you were yeah. suggesting for black um yeah, e4 looks like um supernatural move i mean he's he's opening the bishop on c1 which was which was his worst piece blocked by his pawn on e3 now it's threatening to come out to g5 where that would be pretty devastating with a, a pin on that knight in f6 yeah he's also threatening knight takes c6 and mm -hmm. potentially even knight f7 depending how black plays things could be in the air yeah so derek played bishop b4 and then just two moves later bishop d6 so it's likely that he wasn't too happy about his choice of putting the bishop on b4. Yeah, it was um, bishop b4 should be to fight for the e4 square, which is logical. Yeah. But then he decided, hey, I can't control the e5 square. And if I can't control the e5 outposts, 
then I can't control e4 either ultimately. And so he retreated. Yeah, but he uh, he wasted he wasted some time. Mm -hmm. um, precious, precious time. Yeah, the, there is a way for him to try to alleviate some of the pressure that White has in his position, which is by just exchanging all the pieces. He could take the knight on e4, and then exchange on e5, even take on d1 at the end of that line. So they would uh, go immediately from this middle game position into an, more of an end game. Yeah. But even that would be problematic. I mean, White would definitely be better with um, the two bishops, and also with Black having a weak pawn on c6, and also a6, two isolated pawns, whereas... I guess white does have the pawn on e5, but it's only one weakness, and right now white's the one putting more pressure on black's position. Yeah. If black had maybe one extra tempo of development, I might think that you could save things by going for that endgame. Mm -hmm. Like, if you could just plop a piece on d5 here, yeah. and maybe the best defense would be to plop your knight on d5 here and be willing to lose a pawn. But if his bishop were on e6 and he could just put a piece on, on d5... Then he might be able to fight this end game. Exactly, and yeah, what you said about um, maybe playing knight d5 and and trying to give back, just give up a pawn to um, at least get rid of some of the pressure, go force white to go for an opposite colored position. That makes a lot of sense, but I think I think that because the opposite colored bishop end game has such a high drawing <laughs> there's such a high drawing chance i don't think var would actually take that pawn i think he would just maybe move his bishop out from c1 and um continue development instead of going for that pawn this match is looking very close 24 to 19 quite close as i refresh this and see that pieces are being traded so we are heading towards what we had headed to um oh but not a queen trade interesting okay um but looking how close the match is it's a five point match and the interesting thing is that san diego surfers on boards two three and four have some slightly higher rated players and they're playing their games a little bit like slower so there's a chance that the san diego surfers will get one or two more points from those high boards uh, at the end of the match and uh, am i correct in saying that in the group a in the standings san diego is currently in fourth out of four yes um okay so they would really like to win this match yeah actually i mean if san diego doesn't score some points today they basically can't qualify to the summer series championships at the end because um it's only a three-week series um for this division and uh if they went through two weeks with zero points out of three weeks there's no way they're going to leapfrog the other teams in one week at the end of that yeah um yeah and to show everyone the standings real quick um here you can see the mechanics have five points the pandas have four the archbishops have three and the surfers have zero um but you know var is the only grandmaster in the lineup this week so if he last week he he got those three points for st louis by winning the knockout if he wins the knockout again this week as the only grandmaster playing this week um you know st louis can quickly get into a good position catch up with either the mechanics or the pandas this week so, and so yeah the mechanics and pandas are playing right after this and mechanics have five and pandas have four so that's yeah. that's obviously a really big matchup as well yeah whichever Whichever of those teams wins their matchup will be in really good shape. Maybe not like clinching a spot in the championships part of the summer series, but like very, very close to it. Mm -hmm. um, so Verusian insisted on that queen trade. After queen e7, he played queen d6. Uh, he definitely wanted that. And uh, what do you think of this, this endgame that's now emerged where the e5 pawn has become a d6 pawn? Does that improve white's chances in this end game or hurt him 
Yeah, I think it, it actually improved his position even more. Um, on e5, the pawn wasn't a pass pawn mm -hmm. because the f7 pawn was in the way. Now it's just by the pawn d6 is just by itself. It's a pass pawn. And having a pass pawn can be double edged. It, in some cases, it could be a weakness as well. It could be targeted. Mm -hmm. And by pile up and take that pawn. But here, white has a bishop on a3. Black has no really no way at all to try to counter the effect that the bishop is having, just protecting the pawn on d6. Um, he has no dark square bishop himself. He has no real way to block the bishop with the pawn. He can't play c5 because that square is covered. Mm -hmm. um, so the only real way he can attack d6 at all is to try to bring his knight back, maybe knight to e8 to hit that pawn. But white can always protect it with his rooks in the d file. Also, when he moves his knight from d5, his, uh, his c6 pawn is immediately attacked by white's bishop on e4. That's a real and, problem for him, huh? This knight already... The only piece, as you say, that can challenge for the dark squares is going to be the knight, and the knight is stuck because of c6. Yeah. And probably with Var's last move, rook f2, I think he just wants to bring that rook to the c file, put it on c2, and increase that pressure on the, uh, the c6 pawn. Yeah. So a5, this is an idea I was thinking of. It has the idea of maybe playing knight b4, um, mm -hmm. okay, sort of good... fighting for some simplifications, right, to cut off this d6 pawn. But when I thought of it, I thought that the move bishop c5 would would most likely answer it well. Yeah. After bishop c5, knight b4 no longer cuts off the bishop. But even, yeah, rook c2 or maybe rook c5 was another option. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of a lot of good options probably here for white. Um, so he just went with rook c2, and mm -hmm. then Derek immediately responded with f5. Yeah, he's trying to he's trying to shake things up somehow, right? Get some kind of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just well, obviously he's hoping for, <laughs> he's praying that White would give up his bishop and take the knight on d five, but mm -hmm. but Var is not going to give into that bishop back to f three, and now now c six is under attack again. So Derek went back bishop d seven. Can he play um, rook takes c six? <laughs> he he can do it. Rook takes c6, bishop takes c6, rook takes c6. But Derek wouldn't take back again on c6 because then there's the uh, the fork with bishop takes d5 check and, and taking the rook. But instead, mm -hmm. Derek would uh, just move his knight away. Maybe knight f6 or maybe knight b4 is a little bit stronger. Mm -hmm. And it looks like um, as long as he's not losing material, which I don't think he is, then then he's happy that white gave up the exchange. Right. And it might still be a fine position for white after something like rook a6 or whatever, but black would feel like they've got a little bit more of a chance there because at least it's messier. Mm, definitely, yeah. All right, let's see what he did go for. He played bishop takes d5 check and then rook c7. So he gave black the opposite colored bishops, which has been one of black's dearest hopes up till this point. That doesn't necessarily mean that black's going to be saved. No, it doesn't. Um, he's still increasing pressure on Black's position, but honestly, I'm a, I am a little bit surprised that he decided to take d5. I mm -hmm. was wondering what was wrong with um, rook c5, just hitting the uh, instead of bishop takes d5, it's hitting the pawn on on a5. He wasn't obliged to do anything, so he must have been very confident about this choice, right? I mean, he could have played king h1 and waited for you know black to get short on time he could have played bishop c5 rook b1 whatever so you're suggesting rook c5 going after a5 right yeah that, that was the move i was thinking about and if yeah. black tries to play a4 then you can just take the pawn and sure push it to a5 yeah why not take that pawn hmm it seems like a good option too. So let's see how good his choice was, if it's if it's clearly winning or not. Well, I mean, a4 black didn't have to play a4. 
Right. Yeah, he also didn't have to take on c7 immediately. There wasn't an immediate threat. Rook takes d7 is an idea for white. Um, removing the guard of the rook on c8. But mm -hmm. the reason it wouldn't have worked immediately is black would have the in-between move rook takes c1 check. After the bishop recaptures on c1, then there's rook takes d7. Um, so that was an immediate threat, but probably VAR would just play something like king f2 or bring the other rook to c5, to pressure on all black's pawns on the, the fourth rank there. Right. So, and that would force rook c7 anyway next move. Yeah, I guess Derek decided he was going to have to... Uh, have to take at some point but now the the pawn which i think this pawn must have started from f2 right now it got all the way up to c7 the, the f pawn is on c7 that's true <laughs> or and actually the f pawn got traded by e takes f3 so this is oh, the e pawn right played e4 e5 so this is the e pawn okay still it's done a pretty good job no this is this the, is the deep the d pawn, pawn that went to e File and ND, yeah. It's the checker pawn. It's the pawn that went up the whole board diagonally. <laughs> it hasn't touched a single light square this entire game. And uh, with opposite colored bishops, maybe it never will. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. Um, but yeah, now the position is probably going to end soon. Um, mm -hmm. Far is up to three connected past pawns. There goes one of them. That's good. I guess he's just switching over to the king side now with rook d7, or what? What's his thinking? Um, yeah, I guess, I guess rook d7, or he played rook d8, and black's rook and bishop are basically stuck. Yeah. <laughs> stuck there. My um, stupid way of playing this would have been rook b4 defending the b pawn, and then a4, a5. But okay, something else. Yeah, my, my first thought would have been to just try to hold on to that B pawn because it's so nice um, connected with the C pawn. And then you also have the A2 pawn, which can um, get to A5 and be, you know, become connected with those three pawn, two other pawns as well. Um, but in this position, basically, I think everything is winning. So I okay. probably just saw a way that he, he liked and just went for it. Okay, so you're certain this is winning? Because I'm looking at this and thinking, like, I'm not 100% sure. If I were playing Blitz, I wouldn't really know. Um, back, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is winning. Also, yeah. practically. Um, he's just going to march his king, huh? Yeah, he's just going to take f5, then he can go after the h-pawn, and Black's rook is, is stuck to c8, and also Black's bishop is tied down. The only way... Black probably should have tried to, um, to maybe put his bishop on a6 and king on b7. Mm -hmm. Then at least he can um, free so the he's bishop. Trying to do that now. Yeah, so then he can try like to play h3 and put his bishop on f1. So at least he doesn't lose that h pawn. But since he he wasted some time moving his king all yeah. the way up to a4 and back, he didn't allow himself time for that. So now now White also has the past h pawn and he has three past pawns on the opposite sides of the board and it's completely winning. That'll do it. As we say, the pants are really long on these pawns. Very, yeah, very long. <laughs> Tough to deal with that. Um, but yeah, I mean, the king march to a4 was the opposite of what he needed to do, which was free his bishop. If he freed his bishop, it would have taken some work for white to win this end game. Yeah, if he freed it... Um... I mean, one thing White could have done is, let's say they had the same position, but Black had got got in um, h3 and bishop f1. One idea is White could just p push his a pawn all the way up to a6 check mm -hmm. and force Black to take with the bishop. Mm -hmm. And then if White's king is on h4 and g3, he can still take the h3 pawn. So it would be the same position as in the game without him having the a pawn. But still, these two pawns, h2 and c7, are so far distant that um, he should just be able to run the h-pawn up the board and win the bishop for it and then exchange rooks and win the game. Um, so I don't think it would have made a difference in the end. Okay. Yeah, so uh, 
tough, tough end game to defend that whole time there for Derek. And VAR gets off to another good start today, 2-0. Um, now I'm watching New Jersey Panda um, playing black against the Endgame Magician. Okay. New Jersey Panda should probably be playing for the Chengdu Pandas at some point, maybe in the second match today. But uh, right now she's playing for St. Louis. And uh, it looks like St. Louis has probably won this match because they've got 29 points now. I think they needed about 26 and a half, 27 points to win the match. They've got 29 now. They got a couple important points even up on the top boards. Um, like from Kanya Mazibuko uh, won the second game. New Jersey Pandas position looks good. Yeah, I didn't have that game up, but I think I just was able to find it. Um, yeah. People malign the French, but uh, but this version of the French looks great. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, I still haven't found the game. I see you. That's all right. Up, I'm not able to... Uh, Oh, you can't find the... You can't click on it to see the board. I'm clicking on the board, but it's... it's yeah. Opening. So you oh, probably have a couple no, different... I did, I did get it. Okay. Yeah. On the side. Right. Oh, wow. This... Yeah. It was, yeah. This is... Uh, this was a French. Yeah, this is a very happy French. Yeah, look at that pawn structure. All the way... This is like gonna be like three touchdowns at once three touchdowns at once what white is lacking is like a checkmate on g7 while black did all this that's what white needed here i mean if uh timeout a timeout and that is the match st louis scores 30 points san diego 22 um san diego the fans really turned out they put up a great effort in this match um that I mean that was impressive, but unfortunately St. Louis is just such a such a chess place now. It's tough for the rest of us to compete. Yeah, um, yeah, good good battle by San Diego. Um, also, good battle by Derek against Var, especially in the first game. I think he uh, he definitely had some chances in that with the queen versus the, the rook and the bishop. Yeah. In the end, Var throwing that queen takes a2 before trading his queen. That seemed to be kind of a a really important factor because it gave him that plan of running the a-pawn uh, while white was trying to work up threats on the king side. Yeah, indeed. But I, I still feel like I still got the feeling that Derek had did have some chances. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, even in the final position where he, he flagged, he... The game still wasn't quite over it. He did have a couple more checks with his queen, which Far would have had to deal with. All right. So um, I guess we would say at this point, San Diego is kind of on the brink. They need they need Derek to score an upset in this knockout. I think if they want to make it to the championship series, they're also um, they're also going to be playing through the qualifiers to get back into the main pro chess league um, in the in the fall this year. So. You know, it's really important for them to, you know, build up their team for that qualifier. Um, we're going to take like a three minute break here, everybody. And uh, when we come back, there's going to be a four player knockout match. I'll show you guys real quick what. Uh... Oh, no. Uh, we'll show it to you when we get back. We'll show you the bracket and all that. Um, so, yeah, see you all in a minute, in three minutes.
right. Um, welcome back, everybody. Um, we are about to have our knockout for today, four player knockout. Um, let's see. So, um, in the knockout today, we're going to see Verusian Akobian again, the winner from winner from last week um, and we're gonna see a couple other players actually I can call up the cards and we can look at all the players who are gonna be playing but first I want to show the pairings so here are the pairings um, the player at the top of the screen is playing the player below them so like Bao Chi Lin is playing against Derek Wu in the first round, and Verusha Nikobian is playing against Ezra Chambers. Um, also, the player at the top of the screen is going to be the player with the sort of advantage, so to speak. Um, first of all, they'll play a one game 15 and 2 where they get white. If that's not enough to win and the game is a draw, they will then go into a 1 1 tiebreaker where um, they have to play black, but they get draw odds. So, pretty heavy advantage. What do you think, Ray? Definitely. And that's that's because they gained more new fans this last week. Is that right? Exactly. Um, okay. Basically, I think the, the seedings of 1, 2, 3, and 4 show how many fans they gained this week. So, uh, mm -hmm. the Pandas gained 66 fans, and the Archbishops gained 65. So... Oh, wow. One <laughs> one fan away. Um, By the way, was um, was New Jersey Panda playing for the Archbishops? In the um, last game. That, yes, that in the last okay. game that we watched, New Jersey Panda was playing for the Archbishops. Just a funny name because they weren't playing for New Jersey or playing for the Pandas. But exactly. The Archbishops. Um, but yeah, I think it's obviously huge advantage um if you i mean you have draws in the second game and then also i mean i, I guess this it depends i think if you're already higher rated also then it's it just increases your advantage obviously um obviously draw odds help but since it is a just a bullet game there is going to be more potential for an upset so i guess the draw odds aren't I'm completely limiting the chances of the uh, the player with white. All right. So let's see. Player cards. We've got Bao Chi Lin. His username is Buja He Bu Guai. Do you know what that means? No, but do you have you like learned any? I've learned a little bit, but I had to look up. I had to look up some of these words and try and guess at it because, like, j could mean like a hundred things. Guai could mean a hundred things. I'm pretty sure bu means you know not. Like he's not something and he's not something else. Bu j, and he's also bu guai. Um, my best guess, based on the different words that j or guai could be, is that it's not wise and not clever. Is his username? I think. <laughs> Or I guess it'd be better in English to say neither wise nor clever would be more elegant. Anyway, I, that's my best guess. If that's what his name is, then it's pretty funny and elegant, I would say. But yeah, well, I asked because I liked your um, I liked your pronunciation. It was it was much better than most foreigners. Better than sure. average foreigners. <laughs> better than the average Y Guo Ren. Um, uh, yeah, so um, that's my guess as to what his name means. He's only played one match for the Pandas uh, this year, but he's uh, you know a young IM in in the twenty four hundreds, mid twenty four hundreds, and he's going to be carrying that sort of fan club advantage throughout the knockout of always playing white in the fifteen minute game and always having draw odds in those bullet games. Um, 
All right, next we've got Derek, who we all already met, but we've got a really cool picture of him to show everybody. And um, then we've got Verusian, who we've talked about uh, and who we've already watched win two games tonight. But mm -hmm. here's Grandmaster Akobi in St. Louis, except that's his normal username. Today he's playing with the official STL Archbishops account. And uh, finally, a guy that we'll hear from later, probably, Ezra Chambers. Um, he also has a pretty cool username. You want to try and say his username 10 times quickly? It's Selfish Shellfish. Selfish? Selfish? Selfish. Selfish Shellfish? Yes, that... so an egotistical okay. sh 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 Shellfish. Okay. Selfish Shellfish. Selfish Shellfish. Selfish Shellfish Shellfish. Okay. Ah, know. impossible. <laughs> All right, so Ezra scored his first point. A grandmaster can't say his name. Uh, we'll see if he can score any other points in the uh, in the knockout. He'll start off, I would say, with the toughest pairing, black against, uh, against VAR, at least on paper. Uh, <laughs> that should be kind of tough for Ezra. Um, the games are starting within one minute, everybody. So get get ready to play. You guys might just have enough time to say selfish shellfish five times yourselves before things get going. Um, and yeah, so let's let's see. Let me go to my slides and see if I can show prizes for a second. Um, so one thing about how these knockouts work is each week there's a $200 prize for that knockout that week. So there's prizes at the end of the season for that series championship, but each week the players are playing for $200 just in this knockout. Um, uh, yeah, as well as other various prizes. So, um, you know, it'll be three points in the standings plus $100 for the first place player in this knockout and uh, two points plus $60 for the second place player, etc. And uh, now let's let's go to the games. Is there any type of um, voting or price for like MVP of the, the summer series? Uh, I am not sure that I saw any such thing. Thing just yet um i guess besides the like var and the, the four players in the knockout i guess there's not as many set set players who always play week in week out right yeah i mean as far as like an mvp vars played twice but i think for a lot of teams it's going to be three weeks a different player each week so okay. the closest thing we have to that is sort of the fan thing right because a fan can play week after week they can play they can play for different teams, so they can play all 12 weeks even. And uh, the fans are competing for this kind of MVP of fans or most valuable fan prize. Um, they can play for different teams? They can play for different teams. Yeah, not at the same time. You like, <laughs> you can't play for San Francisco and Chengdu tonight against yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but you can transfer. But you can transfer. So like you could have, and I'm sure a lot of people will have played in this first match that we watched for St. Louis and then, or San Diego. And then in the second match, they'll play for either San Francisco or Chengdu. Like uh, Gold Dust Tori, for example, last week she played both matches, probably will again today on her stream. Um, all right, so we've got Archbishops up against Mechanics here. Do you have, uh, have you found both games, Ray? Yeah. All right, what do you think of... Uh, a kind of exchange slot from our high-rated grandmaster. Um, well, I think the last move was very, very interesting. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Var has played very quickly, and he knows the exchange slot pretty well. He likes to play even against, even against um, other GMs, other people with around the same level as himself, which a lot of people avoid doing um, because it, some sometimes the exchange Slavas have the reputation of being too drawish. But right. uh, you can actually play it 
for a win. It just depends on how you play it. I think I think Wesley So actually got his only win in classical against Magnus by playing the exchange Slav. Okay, so if you can win a game against Magnus with it, then then people would be wrong to be overly <laughs> concerned that it's not a reasonable opening choice. <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, he just played b3, which which was very interesting, attacking the knight on c4, which uh, was blocking the c-file, which the open c-file, which his rook was, was on. So he's trying to open that. But the question was whether Black could have tried to take that pawn on a3 with his knight. Yeah, he thought about it for a while. I imagine that what he was worried about was the move knight c5. Mm -hmm. So basically the knight can't easily retreat to b5 because of the rook on a7. Exactly. Um, so after knight a3, knight c5, maybe Black loses a little something. He could try, he could maybe try something like b6. Mm -hmm. um, trying to force the, the knight to move away from c5 and then the bishop on e7 again, again protects the knight on a3. Right, then we could get a funny lineup with the knights on a3 and a6 maybe. Yeah. That would be fun at least. And both of them are, are trapped. And both trapped. Well, actually, I guess... I was going to say, say the knight on a6 is less trapped because it can go to c7, but mm -hmm. if you ever move the knight to c7, then his idea is like knight to b5. Knight to b5. <laughs> that would have been a funny setup. So, I don't know. We're not going to have time to figure out what would have happened because it's a rapid game. But um, obviously, Var thought he could sack the a-pawn, and Ezra thought for a bit and either agreed or just you know trusted his opponent. Sometimes when you're 2,600 people just trust you yeah usually good to trust <laughs> okay so you're saying like you wouldn't just bluff somebody because they're 2200 you wouldn't hang your pawns for no reason and hope they trusted you mm, me in general no, no. Um, i do know some there are some gms who i think struggle against uh people who are a lot lower rated and they play well below their rating against them. I'm not sure the reason why, but maybe it's psychological. Just they they find it hard to take the game seriously. Maybe, like you said, they, they throw in a few bluffs, and then when their opponent actually calls their bluff, that's when they get in trouble. And then they already have a worse position, so they try to, to bluff again, hoping that their opponent will, will be afraid. But yeah. if they call their bluff again, then, then you can quickly get into a really bad position. Yeah, but, eventually you run, you run out of bluffs, right? I mean, yeah, you're anyway, playing you're I, playing a master. They have some idea like what what chess looks like. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I don't think that doesn't usually happen to me because I I usually take everyone really seriously, and I'm afraid of everyone. So nice, <laughs> nice. Guided by fear. So um, I would be afraid right now if I were Derek. Actually, I feel like something pretty serious has already happened to him in his game against uh, Bao Chi Lin. Um, I mean, I haven't looked at it long enough to calculate anything, but uh, I'm just not sure what this knight on g4 is going to do, and I feel like, you know, even if white didn't have the knight on g4 trapped, even the move knight d5 looks kind of scary. Mm -hmm. So... This... Well, he is up. He is up two pawns. Two pawns, okay. So at least he has something, but I agree that the knight on g4, well, it's not just the knight on g4. Like you said, the knight takes it's coming, and that's a big problem because um, white's getting a pawn back, and also d files opening, and black's queen is facing white's rook on the uh, on the open d file, which is not a good position for it to be in. Mm -hmm. So for example, if knight h6 here, then bishop takes h6, g takes h6, and well, there's knight takes d5. There's even in between moves like knight d4, hitting the bishop on c6, forcing the bishop back probably, and now Oof. you could take on d5, uh -huh. maybe with the knight now. Right. Um, 
all sorts of threats like bishop e4 becomes a huge threat almost just instantly checkmate to just checkmate right if knight e7 yeah. and bishop takes b7 isn't enough and ooh. Mm -hmm. Huh, that so looks I'm brutal. I'm wondering if he's going to try to do something desperate like knight takes f2, just knight get a third f2. pawn and um, hope that <laughs> knight takes f2, if king takes f2, like bishop c5 check or something like that and hope that he can make the game complicated and stir up some trouble for white. Yeah. I'm dodging a bunch of lasers that are coming in my window. There's like all over my face i'm being melted lasers <laughs> lasers or i don't know lightsabers <laughs> I, I i can't escape them they're like everywhere in my room ah. <laughs> i hope you survive <laughs> me too me too um man so derek's like deep in thought also as i got desperate i thought of knight f2 like you which is basically just I don't know, just full desperation. <laughs> yeah, after knight takes f2, king takes f2, another idea could be to put the knight on c5 and then try to put it on d3. That would be a nice square. Um, but I suspect yeah. that it's probably going to, probably white has enough time to to cause even more problems with maybe knight d4. Knight, knight d4 d5. might still, knight d4 might still be the sort of Mm -hmm. killing kind of move black just has to keep control of d5 if they lose d5 then you know then things are crumbling and they're down a piece yeah are you the puzzle rush guy ray somebody's asking is this the puzzle rush guy and i don't think they mean the chengdu pandas um the puzzle rush guy i mean i i am a guy and i play puzzle rush you play um, puzzle rush but okay. yeah, I'm pro I'm probably he probably considers me the puzzle rush. He's probably guy, thinking so of you. I, yeah, him I am. Have you streamed Puzzle Rush? Oh my god, H5. <laughs> H5? Oh. Um and what's the idea after Queen takes H5? I, I don't know. I mean I think it's just it's like so bad he was like, well Okay, he played F5. Yeah, that's what I was expecting, I guess, but again there's Knight d4, which looks yeah. like uh Yeah, well, that yeah. was a creative solution, but it's brutal. And, I mean, white could even still play h3 at some point, right, if they want to force the issue? Does that not win the game? You could, but you could probably just... I mean, knight d4 also gains a tempo attacking the bishop mm -hmm. on six. I think black has to go back. Okay. Bishop seven. Yeah. And then now you could take... I probably knight takes d5. Okay. I didn't even know if you were going to say f5 or d5. <laughs> yeah, knight f5 also was a move. I guess knight f5, I was wondering if there's like knight f2, try to force white's king to the f file. Though. Right. Um, I mean, I can't even find a move that doesn't work for white. Like knight e6, if queen e8, sort of saving the rook on f8, after queen e8, rook e8, you still have knight c7. So you still, <laughs> I mean, like you would just resign in a tournament game here against a good player i i think <laughs> <laughs> no don't never resign never um, resign well i mean don't resign on move 15 don't re try to try to make it a little bit further um no i, I wouldn't resign here but i would uh, on the verge of resigning if my opponent made a few more good moves yeah well no i meant um, i might resign that position if i allowed white to play knight takes c7 because by then I'm losing like the rook and the d5 pawn. Well, if I mean if he's able to get to an end game where he's only I mean not good to only be but only down in exchange at least you know he could still keep playing on there. He's mm -hmm. not losing all his pieces or not getting checkmated, and you know I don't know he has some pawns on the queen side if he could start start to get them rolling before I mean that that's his only real hope but. Um, um, white played queen g6 so he is he did decide to attack that bishop but he did it with the queen um and now oh but now knight takes e5 did he just blunder oh no he has queen e6 check okay 
So yeah, knight takes e5, knight takes e5, and now queen e6 check. Okay. Hitting king, hitting the knight on e5, and if the knight moves back to block, then then it leaves leaves the bishop on c6 alone and undefended. So black is going to have to give up either the knight on e5 or the bishop on c6. I think he will give up the knight on e5 because um, that bishop is protecting that d-pawn. Once that bishop yeah. is gone, um, all those pawns are going to start falling. Yeah. I I have to say I'm not sure how he's going to defend d5 even with the bishop after e5 falls. Do you... Have you already seen a way for him to save this, or? <laughs> well, I don't think he can save it, but yeah, bishop f6 makes sense hitting the queen, but after queen e6, again, that that bishop is targeted, so white gained the tempo, and now now white's ready to take on d5 next move. So no, I don't think there is there was a way for black to save d5. Um, and there's not really a way for him to save save anything it should just be should be pretty lost here okay that's my feeling too let's check in on the other knockout game um and it looks like nobody's getting knocked out just yet there although far has managed to get everybody to the c file yeah everyone's on the c file so now now bishop takes d6 becomes a potential threat i guess it's i guess yeah. it's not a threat immediately but that's one idea how would you answer bishop takes d6 right now with rook takes c6 huh yes and then if you if you take on c6 i can just take back on d6 and if you instead of taking on c6 if you try to take on e7 then we're just both throwing in, in between moves back and forth at each other then i take on c2 you take on d8 I take on c1 check, knight takes c1, and then rook takes d8 at the end, so black is uh, merged up in exchange. All right, so if there's no threat, which I just confirmed by playing king h8 for everybody, followed by your lines, um, can black play queen d7 here? Or does that allow bishop takes d6? You, you can play queen d7. Um, some of these lines with bishop takes d6 might end up with white winning the pawn. Um, for example, queen d7, bishop takes d6, rook takes c6, queen takes c6, queen takes d6, and now white could exchange on d6, take, take, rook c6, and white's hitting the bishop and hitting the, the b pawn. So white would probably win a pawn there, but... Um, I mean, it's not necessarily over. Black would still have some chances to defend. Okay. There might be some chance for them to trade on d3 to get the opposite colored bishops and only lose the b6 pawn. Yeah. If Black trades and puts the bishop on b4, even though he's down a pawn, the, the b3 pawn, which is White's extra pawn, is actually just completely controlled by Black's a5 and bishop b4 um, combo duo. Mm -hmm. The real issue, why the reason why I would be a little bit hesitant is that black has played f6, and so the e6 pawn is also weak, and black needs to take time out to protect that pawn as well. So I don't know if he can get his ideal defensive setup in time. Yeah, yeah, and e6 is even going to be potentially a long-term problem as well as an immediate problem to untangle there. So let's <laughs> see. I have refreshed the actual position. And in the actual game, Ezra is simply traded on c6. Var recaptured quickly, and Ezra's time continues to tick down, looking like he's under he has, considerable uh, pressure here. He has about a seven-minute time disadvantage. He cannot move very much at the moment. I mean, without losing something. So it's, it's almost too long in this c-file area. Yeah, it's, it's funny. It's, the position looks almost symmetrical. The knights are in the same spot. The bishops are in the same spot. The pawn structure on the queen side is the same. The king mm -hmm. side is almost identical. The only real difference is that white is controlling c file, and he has this uh, queen on c6. Black's queen and rook are, are stuck in the back, and yeah. that's making 
all the difference um, because white's controlling the C file. Um, black just black just has almost no moves. Okay, he played queen b8, and now I guess I mean the question. One question is what he wants to do after queen d7. Yeah, there may be nothing he wants to do, but he's going to resort to something. Um, let's see, queen d7. Got to defend that bishop. If queen b7, rook c7 can kind of roll that out. Um, so queen d7. Oof, 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 oof. Maybe he, can you try like just rook, something simple like rook, um, let's say rook e8. Mm -hmm. And now how does white continue? Because white would love to play let's say rook to c6 there, mm -hmm. <laughs> just attacking the knight in d6, which is pinned. Um, but black's idea is to play e5 and uncover and attack against white's queen with his bishop, and then also, of course, hitting the bishop on f4. Yeah, and so deal was... with this problem on the f4 diagonal. So the mm -hmm. idea I would toss out for white in response to, um, in response to rook e8 would be g4 trying to get this e6 square for my queen. Um, and I'm not sure what black does after that. Yeah, g4 is a good move. Um, yeah, probably white is just going to win some material there. Maybe instead of rook e8, black could have tried rook f7 mm -hmm. with the same idea of threatening e5. And yeah. there, if g4... Mm -hmm. um, well, still might not be great. I was, I was trying to see if Bishop F8 was a move there. By the way, for everybody watching, I see that Bao Chilin has won his game. We'll 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 wrap that game up at some point. We'll pop over there and see what happens. But uh, let's see. So Verusian also he played Queen C7, not Queen D7. Um, again, there may have been nothing wrong with Queen D7. He may have a position with more than one way to win it. Um, after rook e8 defending the bishop, he traded on b8 and then played rook c6. So he had the advantage of the better queen and rook. Now he's traded off the queen to just have the advantage of the better rook. So he's really going for a very simplifying strategy here. If anything, maybe giving up a tiny bit of his advantage, though not on the clock. Well, the problem for black is just that this, this knight in d6 is, is pinned and it's under attack and... The only way to defend it is with rook d8, which is a uh, which is a good move, but it leaves the b6 pawn hanging. So white will just take that pawn and oh, okay, he's gonna rook c8. But yeah, if if white if rook d8 rook b6, white just wins that pawn and is up a clean pawn, and still with more active pieces. So yeah, he should be winning in that case. So he, Ezra has tried um, rook c8. Very interesting. Um, I guess his idea is if, well, probably whatever I does, but let's say rook takes d6 because that's the first idea that came to my mind. Rook takes d6, bishop takes d6, mm -hmm. and bishop takes d6. Then I guess he wants to, um, to activate his rook with either rook c2 or maybe rook, just rook c3. Mm -hmm. and, um, at least his rook has some activity. <laughs> which, um, well, for most of the game, it's been the white rook, which has dominated the c-file. Yeah. Should still be a really tough endgame from black, but we'll see if that's the one VAR wishes. Rook takes b6 seems like even less counterplay for black, and that's what VAR just mm -hmm. picked. Yeah. Rook b6 looks pretty safe. Um, maybe Ezra can try an a4 here and then try to still have his rook waiting to play rook c2 and also after knight e4 you have some ideas of like knight c3 hitting mm -hmm. the bishop on e2 yeah so maybe he can still hope for some counterplay yeah this knight but... needs to be moved he needs some counterplay that would also have stopped knight c5 to put the knight on e4 so that made a lot of sense yeah he tried to play rook c2 first the problem with this is that now avar immediately took that knight off the board <sighs> and even though it was an equal exchange, um, the position simplified a lot. All all the 
potential problems that VAR could have had after knight e4 and then the rook getting to c2 or the knight getting to c3 now they're all they're all gone yeah it just doesn't have any pieces which can attack white's position so i mean there's nothing there's nothing yeah yeah there's nothing equal about this knight versus this bishop right it's like <laughs> oof oof i think here he might also lose to rook b6 among other things <laughs> Yeah, rook b6, he has to give a check on b1 and then move his bishop, but Var just went for the the rook end game. He's going <laughs> to take the a5 pawn and be up. Yeah. Oh, is it just two pawns, but still? Just, um... just two, but enough, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. More more enough. An outside pass pawn and a weakness on d5. I think he's got what he needs. He should... So Var is going to be 3-0, um, right? Yeah. Oh man, he's also going to be up three pawns now. And yeah, and Ezra resigned. Yeah. All right, so the next round is probably going to start super fast. I think there'll be a very short thing in between. Let's just quickly see what happened at the at the decisive phase of the Bao Chi Lin versus Derek Wu game. Queen to e8 was played, and then the d5 pawn was won. And then white had an extra knight against basically zero pawns. Maybe one pawn at most. Pretty easy. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that was pretty, pretty straightforward. Basically kind of opening disaster. Maybe the most instructive thing would be to show everybody this break on move 12 that Bao Chi Lin used. Because this is a super useful thing to know about. Um... I don't know for sure if Derek knew about it or didn't know about it, but this pawn break with d5, and then when the opponent takes back to not recapture on d5, because, you know, ed5, bishop b7, and things would be looking a little bit blocked up, but instead to play d5, and then after ed5 to play e5. That's a way to often open things even more and really hurt the knight on f6, where... If we just gain space with e5 without playing d5 first, the knight would come to d5. And again, black has a blockade and a square for his piece. So um, very often this d5, e5 idea is super strong. The knight goes somewhere where horrible in this case. Could have also gone to e8, I suppose, and not gotten trapped-ish trapped, trapped -ish by queen f5. But you know, if it goes to e8, then we get something, some simpler version of knight d5 or knight d4 by knight d5 and everyone can see i think that this knight on e8 is poorly placed as the as the game opens up there yeah and so. um well you, i think you already basically mentioned it but the other advantage of of giving the pawn up on d5 is not only do you force black to take away the, the d5 square from his own knight, but since you push away from d4 you also gain the d4 square for your own knight so right a pawn but, but here knight becomes much more active especially in this position where it also hits the bishop on c6 that's just an added bonus and uh and black's knight becomes much worse yeah so um a classic technique watch out for that when you're on the black side of the catalan look for that when you're on the white side everybody and now we are on to the championship match uh where bao chi lin by virtue of one extra fan this week for the chengdu pandas <laughs> is playing white against Verruja Nakobian. It's basically Verruja's first time playing black. Shout out to the extra fan. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whoever you are, the last person to register for the uh, fan club last Wednesday at, you know, 11 a.m. or noon or so, you were the one who did it for the pandas, for Bao Chi Lin. And, uh, yeah, last week VAR only played white. And uh, he won his games very convincingly against the Grunfeld and the Kings Indian. Now he's playing what chess.com labels a pseudo Tarash defense. It looks like a pretty, pretty real Tarash defense to me. Yeah, it it uh, it is a real Tarash, and Var has a lot of experience. Again, it's one of the openings, kind of like the one um, in that first game. Where against Derek, where he played the Pyrrhic with C6, Queen A5. This is one of the openings that VAR used to play all the time with Black. Yeah. 
and um, so he has a lot of experience. But it, just like the uh, the peer line, I think he's also stopped, or I think he's pretty much stopped. I haven't seen him play it recently. Yeah, he stopped playing this with Black, but he did play it against me in our Blitz game today. Okay, uh, so this is like this is like throwback for Var. I mean. Mm -hmm. The openings he's picking here are sort of like throwback Verusian. And, uh, you know, these young opponents he's playing against, they should have asked us for uh, for some preparation advice because these are exactly the openings that I can remember preparing when I was going to play VAR, you know, 10 years ago, like, or whatever, yeah. eight years ago or something. This was, like, exactly the stuff that I, that I remember looking at. So, and yeah, very... The Tarash is, um, it's mostly just to get active piece play. So Black, mm -hmm. by playing C5, he he's giving himself an isolated pawn. Um, White has the option to give Black this isolated pawn. There's no way to support it anymore with C6 or E6. But on the plus side, Black has uh, very active pieces, was able to get that bishop out from C8, which is usually the problem problem piece for black and queen's gambit declined um, structures so so even though it's not played well i mean i still i still feel like the tarash is probably slightly underrated um there was actually a phase where i was <laughs> i played it with black a few games probably back around 2012 and and i did pretty well with it um so even though top grandmasters aren't really playing it anymore I think uh, it's definitely still very playable. Yeah. Kasparov used to play it. One one famous yeah. player who, who uh, you know, valued peace activity. <laughs> but then uh, then he he lost to Karpov a few times. <laughs> yeah. I think he decided to, to switch to some other openings after. Because Karpov's probably about the worst, worst person. To play it play. against. Yeah. Yeah. So um, there's definitely some counter pressure from black against e2. That's pretty typical um, in this opening. It's not just in this position, but uh, you know, black always has the open e file, and as Ray said, their bishop can always come out. So um, e2 is a common point for black to aim some counter play at, and uh, the c file is a common place for white to look for for pressure. Var just played knight e4. Um which is very logical. Um, activating his knight, occupying a nice central square, also contesting um, the c5 square potentially, making it more difficult for white to put a piece on c5. And yeah. I mean, what do you think about bishop takes e4? Ah, the first move that I think of in a position like this, Ray, is always bishop takes g7. But I'll try and answer your question. Bishop takes e4. Um, I assume it would be d takes e4 then. And now I would be concerned about the light squares and the white king. Like, I realize we've isolated c2. I realize we control c5. But I would be concerned that it would be really hard to handle this in a rapid game for white. That, like, that something could really go wrong. Yeah, there, there are... There are drawbacks, but there's there are some positives. As you said, I mean, you are giving up the, the light square bishop, which was also protecting h3, so you need to deal with that. Um, but it does get rid of black's very active knight, and now the c5 square is firmly under white's control. So it could work out positionally if if everything if you're able to control everything. But it is definitely yeah. a risk position. But your okay. idea was to take on g7. Um, and then I guess yeah. to threaten, takes e4. Oh, a bunch of, wait, no, no, this is the position. Yeah, so my idea would be to play bishop takes g7, and then if king g7, bishop takes e4. And I realize black could play queen takes h3 there and not necessarily lose a pawn, but I'm just, when I see an option like this, I always get curious, you know, how well or how badly might this work out. Um, so, let's see. Besides taking a back on g7, after bishop yeah. takes g7, white also has to consider um, moves like either knight takes f2 or yep. maybe knight takes g3. Yeah. And then f takes 
takes g3, king takes g7 there, because there both sides have kind of weakened their their king a little bit. Yeah, I thought if knight takes f2, queen d4 as being um really strong for white, I thought. But um, but knight takes g3 looks really looks tougher. <laughs> I like that move. So nothing this exciting happened just yet. Um, <laughs> Bao played rook to e1 for now, covering e2. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to play a lot of moves like rook e1 on the white side of the Tarash. And so now, yeah, well, rook e1 is useful just because by guarding e2 now, the queen, the queen on the white queen is free. Mm -hmm. So it can basically move wherever it wants. And with white in this in this position, you're not trying to do anything immediate, you know, you need to attack Black's king. You have um, some positional advantages, um, for example, the weakness of c5 square, um, maybe the a7 pawn is isolated. You have some positional advantages, so as long as you can keep your position stable um, in the long run, you're hoping that those advantages will outweigh whatever peace activity black has. Mm -hmm. Varj just played bishop b4, speaking of activity. I've mm -hmm. seen this in the Tarash before. Um... Uh, and I feel like... Um, yeah, I feel like white just probably missed bishop b4. Um, That's what I'm thinking too. There's no <laughs> obvious answer, huh? It's not clear what white wants to do about this, huh? You, well, you could, of course, go back, but that's definitely not what he wants to do. So the other options would be maybe, I mean, you can you can block on c3, but either way you block with mm -hmm. the knight or the bishop, at the very least you're losing control of the c5 square. So yeah. that makes it easy for black to consider c5 himself and also just black doesn't need to worry that you're going to occupy that square anytime soon um and the only other move there could be is maybe bishop takes e4 but just bishop takes e1 looks like it's just not working at all um so he's probably gonna i don't know maybe i mean look f1 back there's mm -hmm. all sorts of ideas even knight d2 so He'll probably end up uh, blocking with a piece on c3, but um, based on based on his time, also I'm, I'm fairly certain he just missed bishop b4. He just missed it, yeah. And on rook f1, he also has to worry about bishop e2 or knight g3. Um, Th those are ideas, yeah. Yeah, I don't think they're quite good enough for black just yet. But I mean, I would worry about them and spend some energy on them if I were white. Okay, he did go rook f1. Okay. Um, another idea is knight g5 which oh. uncovers an attack on e2 and also threatens to take on h3. So after knight g5, um, white can try to block both of those ideas with with g4. Yeah, I was afraid you would say that. <laughs> but uh, there's some, uh, some dangerous, <laughs> dangerous sacrifices possible, like knight takes h3 is even an idea. Yeah, I think bishop that might be the nicest way to do it. G4. And, uh, I mean, white almost looks dead, actually, after that knight h3 move order. Yeah, after bishop 4 if white takes on g4, then queen g4 check, king moves, and then rook e6 to h6. Looks like white's, uh, <laughs> white's getting checkmated yep. in a few moves. Definitely. So, white would, after bishop takes g4, white would have had to play bishop back to g2. Mm -hmm. And then at the very least, black could play bishop takes e2 and then take on f1, and he'd have a uh, rook and three pawns. Rook and three. For uh, two pieces. And you'll probably tell people that black has more material then, huh? Black would have more material. Um, rook and a pawn for two pieces is supposed to be even material, but in most positions, uh, especially in the middle game, it's usually better to have the two pieces. But when you have three pawns, um, that's that's when it's getting to the stage where, um, well, it's usually in the favor of the pawns. 
Yeah. Unless it's like a pure end game with a bishop pair, right? Then they can sometimes overcome that. But most positions, you can't really. Yeah, I think I had a game against Eric Hansen um, sometime. I guess it was sometime earlier this year where I had, I had made a mistake and got to an end game where I think I had two pieces for a rook and three pawns also. But um, <laughs> my pieces were very active, but still I was... I was in big trouble, and the best I could do was to get use those two pieces to give up um, for a rook and two pawns, and just end up down a pawn in rook and game because um, three pawns in the end they're just going to start running off the board, and no matter how many pieces you have, once pawns get too far advanced, um, they're just not going to be stopped. Yeah. So knight d2 is what he chose over knight g5. Um, I don't, I'm not sure what was wrong with rook to e1 here, but white reacted with g4 like things were already really critical. <laughs> so rook e1, um, I see, I see one idea. The one idea I see is knight f3 check. Okay. I see a pawn takes knight rook e1. Is awkward. A, yes, and if bishop takes f3, then there's um, just bishop takes f3, the same idea, mm -hmm. and rook on e1 is still hanging, and the pawn on h3 is also getting attacked. Yeah. So, um, so g4, um, and bishop takes g4. Wow. Yeah. But is this is this so clear? Um, what's far? What's far intending to do here? Because if queen takes g4, then white could try e3, mm -hmm. protecting the, the bishop on d4, also hitting black's queen with his right. queen. So var took on f1, which Trades makes on sense. on f1 first, yeah. And now white will take back, um, could even take back with the king. I guess he's going to choose between king takes or queen takes. Yeah. Let's say king takes f1, queen takes g4, and again, maybe e3. Right. But here, black only has two pawns for the uh, for the for the rook, or for yeah. the two pieces, two pawns and a rook. And so, I think this is a worse version compared to the line that um, that could have happened after knight g5. Mm -hmm. yeah i agree this position to me doesn't look that clear for black um neither black rook is active at the moment and so they basically have a past h pawn to work with but nothing 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 overwhelming just yet um let's see what's happened queen f1 was played then queen g4 e3 rook e6 so this has kept queens on the board compared to king f1 yeah, but I mean, if he, I don't, hopefully he didn't take on f1 with the queen because he was afraid of the queen exchange. Because in this position, white should be, white should be happy to exchange queens. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he does have uh, an open king. He doesn't have the h pawn or the g pawn in front of his king anymore. So he should be happy just to exchange queens. And then in the end game, black still has those positional weaknesses we talked about, backward pawn on c6, the weak square in c5, um, white has two bishops. So I think king takes would have been more precise, or at least that's what I, I think I would have chosen. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm with you on that. Um, tense game. Let's let's click over for one second to the third place match. We're going to focus more on the championship match here, but the third place match is also an interesting position. A knight or Sicilian. So Derek was not lying when he said his favorite opening uh, <laughs> in the interview that none of you could hear. Um, he told us that this is that the Sicilian knight or was his favorite. A very early knight d5 from Ezra. Um, you know, creating a pawn structure, which is not necessarily bad for white, but usually white players don't rush into it that fast. With knight d5? With knight d5 so quickly. 
this is actually a line that I used to play with White against the Nidorf back when, oh, I don't know how old I was, but maybe when I was like 10 years old, this was the line that I, I learned to play with White. And I really like the pawn structure actually um, that he's gotten, okay. where White gets to play Queen D2 and then Knight A5. And the problem for Black is Black would like to play b6 just to force that, that knight away. Um, but then that creates a huge hole on c6, and the knight will just jump into c6. Mm -hmm. So Black basically can never do that. So after queen c7, then White just gets to play b4, and rook c1, rook fd1, and prepare to play c5, breakthrough and on the queen side. And um, Black... I think this position is already worse for Black. I mean, he's played Bishop G6, which um, which makes sense. He wants to play F5 and at least create counterplay on the king side. And here, um, White played F3. Uh, F3 might be okay. The way I I used to play when I was like whatever 11 years old is, I would usually wait for Black to play F5 and then I would play F4 and just block that that advance of the pawn. Um, okay. So you wouldn't see any value in playing F3 yourself? Well... Because you were planning to, to fight for the space on the king side. There are just two different ways of responding to F5. F5 creates the threat of F4 trapping the bishop, so you're forced to either play F3 or F4. Um, F3... I mean, the only drawback of F4 is that I mean, e4 is slightly weakened. Also, black can take on f4, and then he gets the e5 square for his knight. Um, so that's the only possible drawback, I think. With f3, mm -hmm. the drawback is that black does get to play f4 himself, and then he can try to play e4 and still put his knight in e5 and then push through with f3. So um, if white's not in time, then he can actually get into more trouble on the king side, which is... Looks like what Black was doing. He played e4, f takes e4, and now I mean, even knight e5 was would have been a candidate move instead of just taking back on e4, um, because then he's he's still threatening to take back on e4, but he also has the idea of f3, and yeah. so why had to deal with that? That might have been a very juicy way for him to play it actually, because I think the way he played it in the game, it looks like he's not easily able to move the knight and he doesn't have that much play yeah, somehow me. he ended up getting pinned and the e-file got open he had to deal with rookie one ideas so he he looks like he lost a lot of coordination in his position yeah by the way everybody watching on chess.com um realize that this is also on twitch and uh you can click through uh to twitch and uh, there's chat on twitch as well and you can follow the chess.com channel on twitch which is just called chess it is the chess channel on twitch of many but it's the one called chess and uh, if you follow that then you can always get alerts when we've got when we've got shows on of which there are more and more i mean there's junior speed chess championship matches bunch of them coming up and all kinds of chess programming so yeah, if you're watching from chess.com, be aware of that that option to go hit the follow. And uh, let's see. Yeah, we'll we'll maybe get back to the first place match after you predict this. Who do you see after Ezra has played rook e one for white here? Who do you see winning this game, Ray? Or is it too soon for me to ask you that? Um. So this is Ezra versus. Um... Is it first Derek? Derek, yeah. Okay. Yeah, F three was um was just played. That was the move I was thinking about. I mean, it's definitely too early to make a definitive prediction, but I can I can still make a prediction. Um hmm. I'm I'm gonna go with uh I'm gonna go with White winning this game. Okay. Okay. Well, Derek's uh, managed to improve some coordination at the cost of a pawn. Ray thinks that, that oh, White... Oh, wait, 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 with my prediction, no. My prediction, what happened? Is uh, Rook F4, is that just uh, winning some... Oh, he didn't... 
play, but was Rook F4 just winning a piece? It or looked it looked that way, yeah. Um, so anyway, prediction Ray's prediction is going to go back and forth as different things are <laughs> are hanging here. But we're going to go check out the championship game, um, which has finally reached an endgame phase. White's pawns have been split, but at least it means Black doesn't have a passed pawn on the H file at the moment. Um, how 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 do you see this end game? What's what's the first impression here, Ray? Okay, so um, White was able to get into the end game, which was a success. And Black, though, was able to achieve something as well by exchanging the bishops. Um, yeah, White having the bishop pair in the end game would have been a problem for Black long term. Mm -hmm. But but with um, just the two different minor pieces, the bishop and the knight together, versus the rook and two pawns in general, this should be this should be fine for Black. And now he's Black. getting active with moves like rook e3. Okay, so can I ask you a quick clarification on yeah, what you're yeah. telling us? When you're saying the bishop pair could be a problem for Black, does that mean if White trades his knight for the bishop, or if the bit Black bishop remains on the board, is the White bishop pair a problem? Um, both, I mean, if, if you exchange the knight for the bishop, then of course there's not really any way black can exchange an equal amount of material for either of your bishops. There's mm -hmm. not an easy way for black to get rid of the bishops there. Yeah. Um, but even if black's bishop was still on the board, as long as they weren't able to exchange bishops, um, the, the bishop pair would still have been very strong. Um, okay. Because... Well, there's different. It's hard to explain all the reasons. No, you don't. But... You don't have to explain everything. We've already got a really good tip here, which is, if we're in this kind of an end game, with a rook against miners, we will want to trade off one of the opponent's two bishops, whether we've got a knight or a bishop on the board for us. Mm -hmm. um, Ray says that's going to improve our our chances in this end game. Um, yeah, so it's definitely like much better. Let's say if he had the choice, if R had the choice to, let's say, just take the bishop on d4. With his mm -hmm. bishop or take knight in f4, he's gonna he's gonna take the bishop off every single time. Yeah. So now things are getting complicated. I mean, Var managed to get active on the e file, like you said, push some pawns. Uh, at the same time, Bao Chi Lin achieved something too, right? Because he broke up the structure on c6 and d5. So it's kind of moving from a maneuvering phase into probably more of a tactical phase, since long term White's not going to be able to defend three pass pawns on the king side and black's not going to be able to stop white's d pawn so mm -hmm. I, I would assume that it's going to be a pretty sharp fight now yeah i mean white was able to win a pawn at least for the moment but but black, black cleared off all the king side pawns so now his uh his three pawns are all connected and um well yeah he's going to be playing h4 f5 g4 and especially in blitz, I think it's gonna it's gonna be pretty scary for White to have to deal with that. Um, so yeah. knight e seven, he's, he has a big fork on f five coming up. Yeah. So um, it may have been his only way out of the problems on the yeah. d file, right? Because he had d four hanging, but he also didn't want to lose the knight on d five after rook g two or something. So exactly. Um, all right. So maneuvers. So he tonight. played. So Var played king f six. And then knight c6 was played. And I'm just wondering, was knight g8 um, like, re like just an option in general? I think it might have been a move, actually. Mm -hmm. if, if white was okay with the draw. Right, if white was okay with the draw. Um, which I don't know, you know, whether he prefers his odds in the bullet or not. Um, but it looked like a fair option. I don't love the knight going off to the queen side. Since I'm a little scared on the king side, but yeah, with knight g8, the knight is in a, a very strange spot. It it is all the way in black's territory. It could promote into a black knight, um, maybe in another chess variant. But um, <laughs> but the thing is, the black's king is going to be forced to to leave the e7 square and. Knight is going to quickly be able to return. So if king e6, then there would have been rook e2 check, and the knight is going to be able to always return back. So that's that's why I was considering it as a, a possibility. But knight c6 is 
is the first move that everyone would uh, look at playing. So we played knight c6, g4, and now rook f2 check. The problem now is his knight on c6 is hanging. Right. Um, but maybe, maybe it's still working out for him. So now if king g7, the knight can go back to e7 again. And yeah. this time there is no stopping knight f5. Yep, that's it. Knight f5 is happening. So can the king come out to e6? Can he come out and play? King e6. Hmm. If so d5 king check, six, we'll take it with the rook. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe white could have tried. Hmm. Ah, king g5 was just playing. Um, At the least, rook e2 would be pretty decent. Yeah. Yeah, so he, he went up with his king. King, king g5. g5. I don't even know which of them thinks they're winning or, you know, thinks they're trying to win. Like, if there's these options of a repetition with, like, king e6, rook e2, king f6, rook f2, I'm not sure which of them wants it or not. Um, I have the feeling that at least, I mean, if, if there's a choice to play on, I feel like VAR would play on, um, even just going off the fact that he's the higher-rated player. Okay. I feel like. He, he's still trying to win this game. For By sure. the way, Derek has just won the game, so your prediction was totally wrong on that one. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, but uh, more importantly, this is the first uh, the first point for the surfers here in the summer series, so that's that's big. They really needed that. And it uh, looks like he was up an entire rook in the final position, so probably something tactical happened. Yeah, the, the same move, which rook f4, which would have won a piece, um, as, as I mentioned, um, instead of bishop d2, white allowed that the very next move. Oh, right, so, rook f4 anyway, and a full-on full on disaster um, for white there. All right, back to this end game of great interest. The f-pawn has been traded for the d-pawn, which makes it a little more drawish, but it's still pretty, pretty intense. And now black's king is um, going to go to h4. So I guess now we get to see, we get to test our hypothesis. My hypothesis is that Var is trying to win, and he wants to play king h4. Can he go to h4? Then there's knight h6. Knight h6, yes, I just saw that. There's still rook d1 check, right. king h2, and there's even ideas like rook h3, <laughs> uh -huh. which mm, aren't winning, but, but probably they're drawing. Wow, pretty cool, that rook h3 idea. Cool. He's played king h4. <laughs> but he, yeah, after knight h6, rook d1 check, king h2, probably what he would do is just, um, I guess he can move his g rook to d3, and that way after knight f5 check, his king just goes back to g5, and his, right. his rook is not under threat. Okay, logical. Did rook h3 not win? Your original idea? Yeah, rook h3. I think is it would have been a would be a draw. Bishop takes h3, mm -hmm. g3 check, king g2, g takes f2, knight f5 check. Um, it's a key move forcing the uh -huh. king. To win. Now the bishop on h3 won't be hanging anymore, so we just play king takes f2. Nice. Um, like rook d2 check and take b2 pawn. But well, if anyone can win that position, it's black. But I assume that it should be. Draw somehow. Yeah. Uh cool, cool, cool. Very um, nice. Alright, so let's see what they're actually doing. Rook E two has been played. So I think he's prioritizing moving his king to F two instead of H two, because he doesn't like having it sort of stuck in that spot there. And I, I like guess the king were just kind of stalemated <laughs> for the moment. And I guess that VAR is confident at this point, right? It's Black who's looking like they're playing for the win, maybe? He's he's definitely playing for the win. Um, I, yeah, he, he, VAR is probably confident now. It's, yeah, looks like there's not any immediate problems with the king on h4, so he's... He gets to press for the win for free. Now he could check on d1, or he could even just play rook d2, possibly. Mm -hmm. And um, 
Yeah, once the rooks are exchanged, white also has to watch out because king g3 is coming and and there's back rank problems. Black's king is just so much more active than white's king. Yeah. So I think at this point, it's definitely far who's uh, better. Yeah. So um, a general rule for anybody looking for more tips is that when you've got the two rooks against the rook and two pieces, very often a rook trade will, will help you. Um, in this case, basically it reduces the material in a way that kind of makes it easier for black to advance his king to g3 without sort of getting checked away. So it's kind of a simplification plan. And here we see Bao Chi Lin trying to keep that black king away, kind of mm. last ditch pushing him away. But it's at the cost of possibly a second rank in both his pawns. So Yeah, I think he just he felt he had no other choice. Um, he loses the pawn, but if he had allowed the rook exchange and that the king getting up to g3 then that allows also black to push the h pawn so white would definitely be losing there so he's gone for this which should also be losing mm -hmm. but fire um, just wants to push the h pawn way can he play mm, you want to play h4 for a and then rook g4 king f5 yeah but maybe there's like knight c4 there Yeah, that might not be the, the easiest. So let's see. He played rookie to it, kicking the knight. All right. There's a blockade. It doesn't look like it'll last <laughs> forever, but it is a blockade. Got to be careful about rookie three, knight, at, knight to g6 check. I mean, we do want to trade off that rook, but we don't want to blunder anything. So... Oh, why did he play knight g6? I think knight g6. Uh, yeah, well, they're in a time scramble six. now. They're definitely in a time scramble now. <laughs> this this should be winning for black, but yeah, now now that they're down to a few seconds, um, gotta watch out for the knight forks. Yeah. I think that white can't move the rook or the bishop is makes it really hard to play this. Like you're playing with one piece, right? <laughs> Just a knight. Yeah, he could try. I mean, he would like to try king g1 maybe at some moment. All right, h4. And now he has to give up the piece. Oh, but there's king g5 at the end, and it's game over. And he can't come back to g4 and defend g2. Oh, there there would be an amazing trick here. One last trick if white didn't have the a4 pawn. Mm-hmm. Let's say the a4 pawn and the a5 pawns are off the board. Yeah. White could try king h3. And then if rook takes g2, rook g4 check. Yeah. Yeah. Let me see if I can show that for everybody. So you guys are going to have to take the a pawns off in your head. I'm not going to do it for you. But look at this idea from Ray. King h3 defending the rook and preparing rook g4 check. And even if you take the bishop, rook g4 check, rook takes g4. And without these a pawns, it would be a stalemate. That's some quick imagination, Ray. <laughs> nice idea. Nice idea. Um, all right. So that means that um, Verusian has repeated as the uh, as the uh, knockout champion. Um, mm -hmm. So he has won the knockout two weeks in a row already. Um, that's pretty nice. He's put up six points on his own for St. Louis. And uh, since they won their match today, they've got a total of nine points now. Um, so yeah, they've they vaulted into first place. We'll see if like the pandas could maybe catch them because they got another two points here from mm -hmm. from uh, Bao Chi Lin by getting second place in this match. Another two points moves the pandas to six, I think. So if they won their match against the mechanics, they would tie for first place in this division with the archbishops and that's coming up in um uh 27 minutes the match between uh san francisco and chengdu pandas you also have plenty of time to get in there and and join the match um and i hope that many of you will um there are plenty of people who have already joined i guess i could take a second and try and give you guys paste the link in there for you all 
Um, so that could be useful before we go to break to give you a link so that you can all get to get in there and, and join this if you want to. In order to join, you'll need to be in one of the two fan clubs, either the Pandas fan club or the Mechanics fan club. Um, but uh, hopefully you can figure out how to join those. You've got links here from Wind on chess.com. And uh, yeah, you guys, you guys have your time to get there. We're going to have uh, a short break and an interview before that match starts. That's why there's uh, 20 minutes between now and the match. Uh, yeah, so encouraging everybody to play. What do you think of the knockout, Ray, now that you've seen your first knockout? Do you feel like the white advantage was huge or it's fast enough that anything can happen? Well, we never got to the uh, the, the bullet because none of the games were drawn, right? Right. We never got to see that draw odds bullet game. Yeah, I would have, <laughs> I would have enjoyed seeing that. But obviously the, the fan, the fan engagement is super important with the... Uh, yeah, with the odds of getting white and then also getting draws in case of a draw. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting format um, with overall with the knockout and just the, the club matches really focused a lot on on interacting with the fans, which I think is, is great. And that's something that you can do in online chess, which I don't, I've never seen done in uh, over the board chess. So I think... It's utilizing the advantages of online chess. So I think, um, yeah, I think it's a really interesting format. Yeah, I mean, if you're playing the U.S. Championship, your fans can't come in and play a blitz match against Wesley So's fans, and then they're yeah. like, "Okay, we've changed it. Ray's got white next round." <laughs> well, probably Wesley has more fans than me, so so it might not work out. Yeah. Well, who knows? I mean, so far the teams with more fans have won every match. So that's been a pretty big factor so far in all yeah. the matches um, that I've seen, uh, which is now three matches. The first match last week, or did St. Louis have more fans than Chengdu? Is that the one match that, the, that Chengdu won against St. Louis last week? Did they have less fans? So maybe, maybe it's possible to win a fan match with less total fans. Maybe it's possible. But, uh, yeah, today St. Louis had more fans and they won their match. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that definitely helps in the match as well. And I know that Chengdu won last week, but I'm trying to remember. They had pretty similar numbers of fans, but I think St. Louis might have had three or, fran three or four more fans, just not enough to totally sway the match balance. All right, so we'll take our little three-minute break here, everybody. We'll show you some slides. Uh, with more information about the league and uh, yeah stick around we'll be back in a few minutes with an interview
All right, hello everybody and welcome back. Uh, we've got uh, Verusha Nikobian here. Sorry about the name tag, but uh, we've got Verusha Nikobian with us again. Verusha, thank you for being here. Hi guys, hi David, hi Ray, hi everybody. Hi everyone. Um, congrats on your your resume. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, I think I played. Uh, I played fine today. Yeah. How did you feel overall about like the, yeah. the matches and or the the match and the quality of your games? Yeah, it was very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, the first game, okay, I played a little shaky opening. It's one of my blitz openings, and uh, we were talking about how I used to play that all the time in yeah. open tournaments. You played a few times against me. Yes, yes, yes. And obviously, I can't play that nowadays. You know, if anybody is prepared, to, you know, they're gonna crush me there. But okay, for a 10-minute game, and you know, I thought maybe this would be interesting. And uh, you know, I somehow, you know, it looked a little bit dangerous for me, but I think I didn't see anywhere where he could, uh, you know, do anything. So I grabbed his pawn on b2, and uh, maybe he didn't have to give me the pawn, you know. But uh, it, uh, but it was a very complicated game. At some point, I had to find this a5, rook a7 idea when I sacked the queen, and then when he played h4, h5, that was a great idea. And then I had to. Realize I gotta move my rook from f8 so I can take that with f1. I, I'm pretty sure he probably had a draw there at least, but it was very hard because I had this a pawn going in. You know, I had this pawn a3, a2, and somehow I won that game. Uh, and then second game, uh, okay, second game, I think I, you know, I maybe didn't play the best way in opening, but I think it was a pretty good game. And the third game was, I think. Uh, my best game against Ezra. I think I got the kind of positions that I like to play exchange slot mm -hmm. and uh, provoke some weaknesses and uh, and just won the game. And the last game was pretty crazy. I I got a good position, but I missed this move g4. Obviously, I shouldn't play knight d2 there. I think I'm already slightly better there, but uh, after knight d2, it was crazy. Maybe he was a little bit better, but and then this end game, I have no idea. I think, uh, I mean, I could have repeated some point, but I didn't want to at that point. But maybe early on, he could have played better. And then I just had to make sure I don't blunder because I realized I had like two seconds at some point. Yeah, we had no yeah. idea either at first, but Ray said it was really important that you traded the bishops with bishop b6. Is that oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. your opinion? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely, yeah. <laughs> that, that was because, you know, if he has two bishops there, I am pretty much going to be worse in, you know, always going to be worse in end game everywhere. But once. We, uh, you know, I mean, he also made, I think, inaccuracy with this queen g3 move. I think he just didn't see a plan, and queen g3 actually weakened his position. And then I managed to play bishop b6. I think in the end game, I'm fine and have some chances because I have a rook and two pawns. And somehow my rooks got in, and uh, you know, I wasn't, uh, I was, I was happy with my position, you know, but it was very tricky because he had this knight there, and there were, I had these rooks. And at some point, my rook could get trapped on g3, and then there's always knight f5. So I really had to be careful not to blunder a fork there because this knight was very tricky. And at the end, even at the end, I was completely winning, but it was not so easy, you know, like to get this uh, rook away. And then finally, I I, I break through in one. But yeah, it was, uh, I think it was a pretty decent day. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, in the uh, chat, we've got Artak Manukian, manager of the Eagles, yeah. saying hi to you. Um, yeah. And I wonder, do you still feel like, do you feel like some solidarity with the Armenian team? Do you do you root for them when they're playing a team other than the Archbishops? Yeah, I, I mean, they're all my friends. Artak is a good friend of mine, actually. We grew up together. He's a couple of years older than me, but I mean, we just, we go back like, you know, over 20 years, you know even more than that 25 years i've probably known him and we played a lot together i mean and uh, and of course i was glad to see him last year in san francisco uh when we but you know they they beat us last year but this year uh archbishops won so yeah uh, this year your turn yeah yeah i well, definitely good for the guys i'm uh, good friends with Zavin. he's a good friend of mine he actually worked for, for worked for me during the u.s championship he was helping me and a uh, very good second and he worked very hard and uh i didn't perform well but i mean he worked very hard helping me to prepare for the games and uh, staying up late and waking up early so and uh, i'm not as familiar with the other young guys they're just very very young marty rosian and shant you know i've heard of them of course but i'm not very familiar with them because they're much much younger than me cool 
Um, so um, I imagine after winning two knockouts in a row, you're pretty comfortable with this format. Uh, so you, you, I have to assume you'd be pretty happy to play again next week if you get the chance. Yeah, yeah. If I'm asked by our manager, my camel, yeah, I would love to play. I, like I mentioned, I think yes, uh, last week I didn't get to play much during the Pro League this season because with our lineup, we had <laughs> our two superstars and uh, with Leslie and Fabi, I my rating was just too high enough to be able to play when they were playing. So I only got to play one game, and uh, I'm still very excited that we won actually this year. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to play the. the summer league and i'm enjoying it yeah great so i mean if, if st louis makes it uh through to the summer league championships then you'll have been a big piece of their of their season here in the summer league yeah yeah absolutely. Yeah. cool well it looks like they're in good shape ray you've got any other questions here oh um i was just gonna going off that i was just yeah. gonna navar that david and i were talking about if there were an mvp for the summer summer series summer league it seems like you've you'd definitely be a candidate with your your results so far yeah thank you yeah i have uh, happy with the score i'm seven out of eight so far and i had a decent game last week against danya i mean he was he's the highest opponent i played yes uh, mm -hmm. so far you know but that was a pretty interesting game i thought there were some crucial moments and uh, in that game yeah so far yeah i'm pretty happy i'm just happy to play a little bit i haven't played anything since u.s championship and don't have much tournaments coming up in the next few months. Summer, I'm just normally busy teaching summer camps and and uh, no, just just happy to stay active, playing some you know rapid and blitz events until I probably play something uh, in September. And yeah, I do have one um, actual last question. Um, just how do you feel about playing online in fast time controls compared to over the board? Because I mean, we did have. A blitz tournament over the board earlier yeah, today, yeah. Uh, which we both played in. Um, and I know you do play in the Pro Chess League. I've played you there before as well. But besides that, I don't usually see you playing a lot online. Maybe you have some some hidden accounts that I don't know about. But how does it compare, especially when you get low on time and you're playing on like two second increment? Do you find it easier, more natural, just to play over the board since that's what you grew up with, or? Are you okay playing online? Um, yeah, it's, it's a great question. I am. Yeah, I, I don't play much online. I mean, I don't have uh, I don't have any other account or anything. Anything. I I enjoy playing sometimes, but I mostly just do teaching online. And mm -hmm. uh, but uh, once in a while, I would play some of the qualifiers or like a uh, title Tuesday. Actually, even actually won one of them. Nice. You know? Okay. Yeah, yeah, I you know it wasn't clear first, but it was uh, shared first place with uh, my friend. From St. Louis, uh, Francisco uh, Rambaldi, and you know, um, but yeah, um, okay. Uh, over the board, then you have this, uh, you know, yeah. I probably have a little bit more comfortable over the board since I grew up playing a lot of blitz and you know, you know, online. I'm, I think online you just have to be very, you know, you have to play a lot to be comfortable. With, you know, like for example, this last game I almost kind of flagged because I just didn't, you know, I didn't realize how much time I had, and I looked at it like two seconds and I quickly moved and it would have been really pity not to you know, uh, lose a game uh, in that position at the very end but uh, I think definitely like you have to play a lot online to feel a lot more comfortable and uh, you know I probably should do more at some point if I want to play a lot more tournaments because there are a lot more tournaments these days with like the qualifiers there's I think Fisher Random qualifier tournament there's an Isle of Man qualifier so these days actually if you pay to put the time into it and you could really even earn some money winning some of these online tournaments and some of these qualifications. So uh, I completely understand why some of the young players are playing all the time on chess.com and yeah. uh, maintaining a very high rating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can almost have like a career playing online. There's almost enough events. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, that's cool. Well, I'm sure like a lot of our young viewers who are, you know, who are like, you know, kids now and they're growing up in this internet world, they can really look at it and, and already see that that piece is growing and that that's really, that blitz skills are really important. When, when you and I were kids in tournaments, it was like over the board was real and everything else was just like fun or silly or training, but not, not like real. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean uh, definitely chess.com is taking it uh, to the next level with all the events and tournaments happening. It's just uh, so much going on, you know, like it's like every day there is a special event and there's the, the live streams and uh, there's so many people watching. A lot of my students are just simply hooked on the live streams of Picaro, Eric, Eric Hansen, you know, it's like they have their favorite streamers and they, they always ask me about, you know, stuff like that so it's uh i think it's great it's just definitely you know popularizing chess a lot more cool so uh we'll give you one last question then we're going to move on towards our towards our last match which is coming up in a few minutes um my last question for you is if you get to play next week is there anybody on san diego chengdu or san francisco that you'd like to face in next week's knockout anybody you're like come on come play me <laughs> uh, not really i don't know I don't. I, I don't even know exactly the rosters, but I'll be. I'll be happy to play. If, okay. If they, you know, have some of the high-ranked GMs. So the the way it works is it just the, the team selects any players, or yeah, it, they can so pick can any one player. So you can have your top player, your anybody. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'll be happy to face any, you know, anyone. I mean, I really enjoyed the game with Danya. It was very interesting. Yeah. Um, last week so yes i'm cool. just ready, ready and happy to play just happy to play awesome well thank you var i mean it yeah. seems like you've just got a fantastic attitude as well as well as uh results so far in the summer here <laughs> thank just you. thank you david happy yeah. every time you get to move the pieces yeah yeah enjoying it so that's the key i think cool all, all right. right all right thanks Var. yeah thanks. take care thank and you, well Greg. done today okay thank you bye guys bye All right, so I'm taking us over here to the slides and um, I'm just gonna emphasize one more time for everybody uh, that we've got this best fan prize. Every three weeks, there's a $250 prize for the best fan from division A, then B, then C, and then D. Um, and if you wanna do that, if you wanna be the best fan, just, you know, a bunch of you are already playing your games, but what can you do to be better than the other people playing? blog <laughs> post post your game somewhere share them discuss them with your team get active in your team's group you know each of these teams has a fan club group and i'm sure that'd be a great place to talk about your games you know the other people played in the same match with you might might be happy to look at your games discuss them give you advice all that um and uh, i think it would be i think it could be a lot of fun to get to get active talking with your team as well as just playing with them um and let's see what else the schedule of matches that you can play so you can see when they'll be played next week it's the same time as this week as we finish up group a next week it'll be the show will be like today from 5 p.m until 8 30 8 40 pacific um but then when we switch to group b the times are really going to change it's going to become a morning thing if you're on if you're in pacific uh you know in an evening thing if you're in Europe and uh, middle of the night thing, if you're on, if you're in Asia, <laughs> um, but we'll have 8 a.m. start times, then 7 a.m. in July 13th, 20th, and 27th, and 9 a.m. in August. Once all the groups are done, then we'll then we'll have the championship, which should be exciting in its own right. Um, Ray, would you have had any interest to play in these in these strange? new format matches and knockouts um yeah maybe <laughs> i i guess i mean i would have considered it um seriously um well you don't have to play every week right for your for the team you do not have to play every week no in fact only one person can play so you know you're the manager would only pick one person. If I were if I were the coach of the windmills, I would certainly consider playing you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I I probably would have added my name to the list just so that I would be available in case I was I was needed and I could play sometimes. Um, I think yeah, I think it would have been fun. I <laughs> I like playing in the pro league, so um, I mean this yeah. is definitely a different format, but. Yeah. Um, still, I I think it would have been a lot of fun, and I would have 
it's a good way to to help your your team. Like Var was was talking about how he's obviously on St. Louis, which is a super super strong team. They have Wesley, they have Fabiano, so they have um, they have a really stacked lineup um, all around. But especially with those top players, the downside for someone like Var is that because their ratings are so high he doesn't really get to play when those guys are playing because their rating average would be too high. So it's it's really good that he's at least able to play in an event like this, whereas in the normal pro league season, um, sometimes his options are, are limited. Um, so I think that's another advantage of, of this format. Yeah, cool. And um as we as we count down, this match is starting in four minutes. That means it's your last chance, anybody who wants to, um, watching, to come join the match. Uh, we've got one Armenian Eagle, at least, who has just joined. So that's that's exciting and fun um, to have Artak Manukian, one of the best fourth, fourth boards in the league, uh, in the history of the league over multiple seasons, uh, playing in the match today. So awesome awesome to have him and all of you have another two or three minutes to join as well if you like uh by joining the Chengdu pandas fan club or the san francisco mechanics fan club and uh you'll be playing two um you'd be playing two games of 10 minute plus two second against the same opponent one with white one with black um i guess i could just show that with the format here two rounds of 10 and two play alongside your favorite team or just any team just because you want to play and help them earn points in the standings or just have fun moving your pieces around like that's kind of VAR's attitude right now it seems just very happy just to play just to be playing are you on the mechanics lineup david uh like in theory or right now <laughs> i mean like are you i don't know yeah in theory in theory i'm the manager of the team and not on the roster itself so okay. i didn't play any matches uh this season um, I'm not a very good rapid player, but I did play a lot of training games this season at the time control. So I think, I think I finally sort of not like gotten good at it, but sort of gotten the basic hang of it, of, you know, what it's like to play with a two second increment, which is its own weird thing, right? It's different than zero second increment where you're both playing blitz and you're going to flag. You can't take the same kind of risks sometimes. Um, yeah, and it's different than like a real game because as VAR said, you could be just sort of playing an end game and then suddenly you look down, you're like, wait, I'm just going to flag at random while I'm thinking about a move. Um, so yeah, I think, uh, I think the two second increment is this whole different thing. Anyway, I would be, I would be happy to be playing right now if I were not the commentator. Um, and if my rapid rating were below 2200, which it, it's probably a little bit over 2200, <laughs> Not by much, but probably just a little bit over. So you're saying in the future? In the future, maybe. Yeah, if if I do such a bad job commentating that uh, I get kicked off off the desk, then you could, if you want to keep commentating, you could watch me play some week. I'd have to I'd have to have a bad string of rapid games to be allowed in. But uh, maybe in the regular season next year, I'll I'll play for San Francisco. We'll see. I really love commentating, so it's always it's always a trade off between playing and commentating as well. I mean you basically you play and you're testing out commentating, but at this point for me it's like I comment and then like occasionally I would move a chess piece. <laughs> I I don't know. I don't think that there's that I mean you said you love commentating. Yeah. I don't think that many people love commentating. Usually it's that they like playing or yeah i don't know commentating yeah I've, i haven't really done it much obviously but it's uh it's definitely a whole different experience um, yeah yeah the commentating i mean it's true that watching chess always gives me some appetite to play so it's like mm -hmm. it's one thing to like you're watching you're watching and you're like wait i want to play so i do get that feeling um but but yeah i actually have a great deal of fun like commentating especially when people are asking questions in chat and uh i can answer some people's questions that's always that's always fun and uh 
I guess, just being like a fan of the people playing. I tend to be like a fan of like basically everybody kind of, you know, so like, I mean, not 100% everybody, but I've got a very, very broad group of people that I, that I root for. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I, um, how to say it? I, yeah, I mean, I've got like players that I root for teams that I root for and it's, you know, easily you have commentators that you root for. <laughs> I root for them to make a good joke or something. Um, not, not really. I mean, there are commentators that I that I'm willing to listen to, whereas I don't. I don't really watch a lot of commentary myself. Um, okay. I prefer to to play, or if I'm watching a game, to like comment myself or like watch with my friends who are you know IMs or GMs and like talk to them sort of actively about the games as it goes. I don't often watch streams myself, but there are there are one or two people I might watch. <laughs> All right. So the match is underway, mm -hmm. and uh, we've got uh, we've got on the first board we've got Ezra uh, playing for the San Francisco Mechanics. Ezra Chambers with White here in the first game against uh, Bao Chi Lin for Chengdu Pandas. I think also this match. A lot more people have shown up for San Francisco than in the first than in the first week, so we've got a somewhat bigger match as well between San Francisco and and Chengdu. Um, so we'll see if we'll see if San Francisco can keep up with Chengdu. They still have a couple more people, and they're rated you know two or three hundred points higher on the bottom boards, and it's pretty evenly matched at the top boards. And then we also have several other titled players playing as well as. Ezra and Bao Chi Lin. So we got some people to check in on. Um, and we've got. Uh, oh, just. Yeah. Oh, for a second I thought that um, that Bao had blundered to um, a, a tactic. To but, Bishop G5? Uh, yeah, but it, because there's a typical idea Bishop G5, Bishop takes F3. Yep. And Queen D2. Um, and the queen is actually trapped on f6. Help, and, help! You know, yeah, this this normally works because um, if black's knight is not on d7, if queen takes d4, then there's bishop b5 with check, and you win the queen. But um, knight on d7 is, is doing its job blocking the check, so black would be able to take on d4. So this, this isn't winning for white. So I think white actually made a mistake by taking an f6. Yeah, in general, if you're white, taking on f6 is not is not desirable unless there's a concrete trap. I mean, even if black took back with the knight, white wouldn't have wanted to do it, yeah? Yeah, probably not. Normally, white would just move the knight back to, to either g3 or even, even knight ed2, I know, is a, a theoretical yeah. position. But I, I'm guessing that he thought he had the bishop g5 trap in case of queen takes. Um, mm-hmm. But wow, he's I'm playing he's playing something pretty funky as a follow up. Um, I guess on Queen D four, he's looking at Knight E six or Knight F seven or something mm -hmm. interesting like that. Um, but what about H six? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Queen H five G six. I think that's not working for white. I doubt Because now the queen on f6 protects the rook on h8. Yeah. So probably he's going to play um, h6. He'll probably play knight e4. And then black can take on, on d4. Mm -hmm. And yeah, probably probably it's uh, already good for black. I probably think. just an opening disaster already. Yeah, h6 has been played. A bow, I suppose... He'll try bishop knight e4, queen d4, bishop e3, and try to gain time attacking black's queen. I think that's that's what he'll try. Yeah, but black's so solid, it's hard to use the tempo to find anything to attack here. If white went for knight h7 here to get the bishop pair, I think black could take uh -huh. with the rook and play g6. Um. Yeah, knight h7, rook h7, bishop h7, g6, and... I guess you just want to play queen g7 right mm -hmm. um yeah 
Yeah, and if rook e1, threatening d5, maybe just castle queen side first to get out of the way. And yeah, that bishop looks like it's it's never going to get out, so yeah, um, probably going to win in a few more moves. Okay, so, so go 94. Sacrifice. And yeah. black took, <laughs> Bao took all the pawns, just yeah. like Var. It's like, why not? You can't do anything. I'll take it. I'm 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 in agreement with that. I mean, why not have a second pawn? You had to move your queen again anyway. And if rook b1, he, he could even take third pawn. He could, yeah. Sometimes I don't take the third pawn. <laughs> it depends on like how good or bad you are at end games, in my opinion, largely, like how many pawns you need to take. Because like my margin for winning an end game is two pawns. A lot of players like you <laughs> might think once you've got one pawn, you've, you've got enough that you can probably take care of it but for me i like to have that second pawn i think he's gonna oh i i was gonna say i thought he's gonna take the pawn but yeah. i didn't see what was wrong with taking the pawn but yeah. i guess he agreed that two pawns was enough exactly nothing wrong with it that was just his margin for winning he doesn't need three pawns you know some some people certainly do there was a time in my career when three was not even enough for me but uh i think bow is thinking like two pawns is his number Mm -hmm. Well, White did get in f4 with tempo at least, and yeah. so he he liked to play f5 and open up the f file at least um, dissuade Black from casting kingside. But mm -hmm. I guess he has to consider whether e takes f5 is just taking a third pawn for free. Okay, he could go rook f5 and trade in some pieces for the queen. Mm, this is kind of similar to to var yeah to var's game the first game yeah i mean black gets like an amazing development of everything two pawns a rook a knight but it's a knight not a bishop maybe that's not quite as clear but yeah mm. Let's see he's played he's castled he's played f5 and bow said well yeah I'll just castle queen side. That's my simplest approach to this. But I still approve of Ezra playing f5 and trading because at least he opened his rook. At least he created yeah. something on e6 or f7, something to attack. If you've got nothing to attack, I really don't know what you're playing for. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, I mean, he had the b file, open b file, but now he also has the f file. And. Um, yeah, so he has some pressure, some pressure on e6 right now, and also potentially on g7 um, if the bishop moves away. So yeah. it, it could have been worse. Um, <laughs> could have just lost all his pawns for no compensation. At least he has some activity now. Yeah. Maybe the queen will come back to e5 to defend e6 and fight in the center. But I think now's a good time for us to pop around and check on some other games that are being played. So I'm going to I'm going to do that. We're going to go find Gold Dust Tori who's streaming, check out how she's doing and gives us a chance to to tell people uh that we've got the fan experience, we've got the fan stream that that we can check on. And uh looks like Gold Dust Tori is up a piece and trying to checkmate. So <laughs> pretty she has a Piece up and the compensation. Yeah, well, I approve. I always think when you're up a piece, you should use your extra piece to checkmate. Why not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like she she just won a piece right in in the opening or right after the opening around move fifteen, and okay, she see. just kept. Yeah. Let's see black. the tactic. It was just queen f three, and black didn't black realize didn't realize the weakness of the dark squares having played e six and g six. Yeah. Maybe it was an optical illusion. He thought his queen on b6 still was protecting the knight, but... Oh, yeah. Since then, it looks like Tori has uh, has just kept playing well, and now it looks like she's ready to play h5, h6, and just give... Oh, give check... Ooh. Checkmated queen. Oh, not bad. I approve. And the knight... Okay. <laughs> that was a nice move. Is there time to go knight a3, or is it simpler to go rook a1? Uh, I think there's time for everything. Okay. <laughs> knight, knight a3, knight 
96, I think. Knight d6 yeah. would be good too, just interfering with the d file. Nice. So, just tying the rook down to f8. If you guys want to see somebody happy, uh, you can click into Goldust Tori's stream. She's probably pretty pumped about that queen trade. Things are going well for her there. Things are also starting off well for Chengdu with two quick, quick, quick points. Um, all right, she went the A3 way. Now we're going to pop around to some other big games. We've got Artak Manukian against Shachmasteo. Um, it looks like they've got an end game where the bishop pair is going to be a nice big advantage for uh, for Shachmasteo. Or Masteo. Yeah. All right, I got. Wow. <laughs> I was able to build the game now. Yeah, he does. Yeah. Does have a very nice position. He's able to take second pawn. Yeah. Doesn't take a GM to know this bishop pair is good. Um. Yeah. So. That's that's great start for Shach Masteo there. Let's check out another game. F pawn. Good friend of mine. And he's playing here a very complicated game with New Jersey Panda. She's back. She's back uh -huh. and she's found the pandas. So that's oh, good. Panda, panda's back. But she's, it became a, a panda this time. She's found the team she belonged on. Mm -hmm. But actually, now that that bishop trade happened on e4 i'm not sure why i said this was complicated maybe it's just really good for white yeah it's probably just just winning for white i think i mean if you want you could probably even just go after the uh the e pawn yeah yeah it's gone queen three it's hard it's hard not to accept an invitation to f7 right um, yeah, queen f7 is tempting, but the bishop on g7 is doing a good job of, right. of protecting the back, well, protecting f8. Yeah. And there's nobody else to check to join the queen, so better to just go take e4, then e6 is also weak, and it's just, mm -hmm. this is the correct way to play it. So, invitation declined, and uh, well well chosen by, by Mike. And back to our top board matchup. Ezra against Bao Chi Lin. Looks like Bao has sacked one of his pawns back in order to win the game on the G file, maybe. I guess both queens are hanging, so I shouldn't I shouldn't <laughs> decide things too quickly. Whoa. Uh, queen G4, Queen E5 was played like we'd guessed. A7 was grabbed. Trade on F6. Rookie one. If the queen retreats, Ezra gets the pawn he needs back on E6, and things would be basically equal, so... Ah, so Ezra has to sack G2 to get out of the queen situation. So e Ezra decided to take on E5 after rook G8, but let's look at queen takes G8. Okay. Um, so queen takes G8, then the idea was bishop C5 check. And now if, um, if bishop takes on C5, then queen takes C5 check, and the queen's getting... Uh, away from the rook on e1, so it's no longer hanging. Next move, black will just play rook takes g8, and black is winning, having one white's queen. So after bishop c5 check, white has to move his king either to h1 or to f1. Mm -hmm. King f1, then there's a similar idea. Queen f4 check, moving the queen away from Saving the, her. the tempo and then taking the queen. Next move. Mm -hmm. And the other move is king h1, and this is a really nice... Um, the really nice point. King h1, rook takes g8, rook takes e5, and now bishop takes g2 is checkmate. Nice. So this rook g8 move from Bao, this was uh there was some calculation behind that. Definitely. Yeah, sweet move. Man, and if he didn't have rook g8, his position wouldn't have been that great there suddenly. Yeah, uh, so he cuz e6 was pretty much falling. I wonder how how far in advance he he saw this. I'm guessing he saw the idea, but then <gasps> some time. Look what Ezra just played. Speaking of crazy stuff, Ezra just had this rook takes c6 move. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Rook takes c6. That's um, sick. 
he needed something. That might be something. Maybe rook takes d3 will defuse it, though. Rook takes d3 is an idea. You could also throw in a check on h1, possibly. Um, you can't take on c6, though. If b takes c6, then there's bishop f5 check, rook d7, and rook b8 is a checkmate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he did go with your uh, suggestion of rook takes d3. Mm -hmm. So he's just get, getting rid of um, that bishop, which which was going to f5 and, um, and leading to that mate. But, oh, so many tactics. So if c takes d3, yeah. black immediately recaptures with b takes c6. Then there's rook b8 check, and white picks up the bishop on f8. Oof. White would be very happy about that. Very. But after c takes d3, black can throw in an in-between check, rook h1. Now... White can't move his king without losing the rook on b1. But if he blocks with bishop g1, now black takes in c6. The bishop is no longer in a7, controlling b8, so white doesn't have that rook b8 check tactic. So um, a lot of calculation going on by, by both yeah. players in this game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Ezra's scrambling from a bad position, but uh, it is a bit messy. And there's different versions of this where you can get his rook to, uh, or you can get his rook to f6 maybe and uh, try to eliminate black's kingside pawns to give himself drawing chances. Yeah, he could t take f6, or I mean, he could also try to take on, just go for that line with c takes d3, play that end game um, down two pawns, because all of black's pawns would be weak. Black would have doubled and isolated c pawns and also isolated f and h pawns. Ray, he so played he a move I hadn't even looked at. Yeah, King G1. That was oh. not on my candidate list. What on earth is that move? I think Black needs to play something like Bishop B4 just so all the pieces are, are hanging. Yeah, but I think Rook D H3 might be the clinical the clinical move. Not as fun, but well, but crushing. Rook D H3, if I take on... Okay, Rook H1, King yeah. G2... Uh, rook three h two king yep. g three, and then bishop d six check should be exactly. That's what I had in mind. Oh, he just played it. Ezra's down to a couple seconds. He took on f six, so it's kind of going as we, as we were seeing. Uh, the pandas with a nine to five lead right now. This will give them another point here. And uh, about did find it. What's that? Oh, I Bow did, Bow yeah. Did, did play this line that, that we were suggesting, and uh, I think yeah. Ezra just lost on time. And cleans it up. Cleans it up. All right. And boom, it starts again. When you play these live club matches, people, when one game is done, the next game starts. There's no sitting around for everyone else on your team to win the f to, to finish their next game. You just get straight into that, into that second game. Um, so... You know, it's uh, in theory, the whole match takes an hour, but you could finish your two games in 20 or 30 minutes. You don't have to sit around for everybody. Um, all right. Well, while they're on move two, let me see something else. Let's see how Manukian's doing this game. He's got probably a scotch game. I mean, I don't know. It's messy. It's just a guess. Knight to c5 looks like quite a shot. He's got to deal with here. Knight c5 intending knight d3 with um, another one of these huge forks. So yeah. Um, so even though white's up a pawn, this knight d3 threat is is so powerful that probably black is just black is just better. Mhm. Mm yeah, it looks like it. White's options are moves like bishop e4 or bishop takes e5, sacking in exchange. Yeah, maybe. Bishop e4. Um, yeah, bishop e4 makes sense. Actually, he should also throw in bishop d5 check, probably. But um, you want to check and then bishop to e4. Yeah, because by putting the black king on h8, um, then if black plays e takes f4 at some point, you can play bishop takes g7 check, and they won't have f takes g3 check or other tactics on you. Mm -hmm. I think it can only help us to throw in bishop d5, oh, given those two bishops facing each other.
Okay. Well, that's a wild, Sorry. wild one. Bishop e5, king h8, bishop e4, and maybe rook a d8, rook a d1, and then e takes f4 think, anyway, huh? Yeah, maybe just take on f4. <laughs> Looking for some version of rook d2, knight e4 at some point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But possibly you could allow that, and after knight takes e4, you just move the king out of the way to g2. Ah, uh, you could somehow allow the whole thing to happen. Let's try it. Bishop g7, king g7, gf4, rook d2, rook d2. Well, maybe I can play rook e4 first instead of knight e4. Rook e4, maybe rook d7. Yeah. Um, because, yeah. yeah, black's, white's rook is trying to get to the seventh ring very quickly, and if it does so, then you get to take c7, and then the c-pawn becomes a, a big problem. But, mm -hmm. but he did not even, he didn't throw in rook a d8, he just took on uh, f4 immediately. And then we did get to see bishop g7 check. Um, like you mentioned, there's, now it's a check with the king and a so there's no in between f takes g3 checks um but they could have transposed the line if if manukian had recaptured on f4 then rook a d8 might have transposed to the line we were talking about yeah but i guess he was worried about that line so he played um played bishop c2 yeah now h takes and uh if rook to d8 comes he'll probably just move the knight off of d2 Oh man, there's a strong looking move. And black's <laughs> playing quickly here as well, I gotta say. Oh, rook, rook ac1. So, but the rook on c1 white has to be careful <laughs> not, to allow, not to lose to any force with knight d3, but he threw yeah. in rook to e8. And the point is, after knight d3, he's going to move his king probably to f3. And um, black won't have time to take on c1 because a8 is hanging. So... Oh, but he can't go to f3 because of the knight e1 fork, oh, right? that's true. Okay, so he has to go back. g one's the only place to go. And he found uh, it. It's not exactly where he wanted to go. Now, there's, um, now there could be a, a pin. Yeah, that's what that's what it looks like. Black's going for a rook on e2 as some way to tie white up. It's hard to say which way. How's this gonna go? I was also wondering about the immediate pin with um. Rook e2 instead of the check, yeah. Because white's <laughs> white's rook is completely immobilized, forced to protect the knight on d2, and so the knight is also immobilized. Um, so I guess I would have had to try king f1 there, but, um, but, but then rook f2, king g1, and I guess the question is whether black could have made any progress in that position. Mm -hmm. Instead, he's gone for a very, very straightforward plan, trading off white's badly placed rook in order to try and just win a pawn in this knight endgame. Um, yeah, I'm not sure... There's definitely some risk to this approach, huh? And yeah, because the knight on d4 is gonna get is gonna get one of those pawns, so it's gonna either go to e6 or go to b5. So I don't think white is gonna end up losing any material in the end. Um, so knight e6, king f6, knight c7. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe knight e6, king f7, knight c7, knight b4. This knight is b4. Idea. Yeah. So he could go through b5 instead. Um, with the idea of knight a7 defending his pawn mm -hmm. and only take on c7 if black moves the a pawn. Mm -hmm. uh, black also has the idea to play knight c1 and take the b3 pawn. Take the b3 pawn too, that's right. So it's quite complicated. I wonder about king d2 as well for white. That was kind of like the first move I thought of even before knight b5 or knight e6. Mm. 
So then if knight b4, you just want to run with your king, king c3. Yeah. King c4. Whoops. Did king I do d3. that or did he do that? No, he did that. He did that. Okay. <laughs> I was like, I didn't think I clicked on his thing. Okay. He did that. I was about to sort of show a variation with king d2, and then suddenly my the king jumped to d3. But it was him, not a mouse slip. All right, king d3. So that makes sense. He wants to come up to c4, be super active on the queen side. If the knight wants to go wandering through c1, he's like, well, whatever, I'm not sure where you're going. And once his king's in control of the queen side, then he would play a move like knight b5 at some point, I guess. Yes. He could also be threatening um, knight e2 here. So... Knight e2 with the idea of trapping the, the knight in a2? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the the thing I'm worried about is let's say Black plays something like a6, just mm -hmm. to stop knight five. Oh yeah, nice idea. And then White plays your the the idea you mentioned knight e2. Yeah. And then White goes after Black's knight by playing b4, king b3, and taking that knight. Mm -hmm. The danger of White moving his king away from the king side is Black can try to create a pass pawn on the king side now. Mm -hmm. And but he did play a6. And if we get a position with an H-pawn versus a knight, knight is very, very bad at dealing with um, pawns by themselves. Yeah, totally. Um, so white's king is going to be all the way on the other side of the board. And so at most, white's knight will be able to stop the pawn. I mean, that's the best he can hope for and maybe make a repetition, make a draw. At worst, the pawn is just pawn and king are just going to um, outmaneuver the knight. Yeah. And Black's going to make a queen. As you all may be able to see below our faces here, the pandas have just just like had an explosion of points. They always had like a four or five point lead, but suddenly they just got another five points to nothing. Now they've got 23 and a half points, which might might be basically enough. 24 and a half is just, it's like ding, 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 ding for them right now, although he's not playing. Um and it might be enough that they may already basically have won the match or be close to close to it. All right, the pass age pawn, like you said. Yeah, and so what he did, I think, is correct. I haven't calculated it out. Oh, actually, I think it's a draw. So he's he's trying to, he made sure to get his pawn to h2. Yeah. Uh, and so White's knight is going to have to, oh, he just blundered. He is actually losing now. <laughs> oh, Knight G1! Yeah, Knight G1. G1, White missed it! Nice, Ray. Um, um, here, everybody, um, Knight G1 could be played, and if the pawn moves, Knight F3. That's what Ray was spotting. Yeah, I assume that was winning, although still Black could have tried to take C6 and exchange that last pawn. Well, now White has B5, which is not bad for White. Um, but it, instead of King D6, Black could have played H2. Mm-hmm. Forcing knight g3 and then gone after the knight, king f4, knight h1, um, king f3. The game just ended in a draw correctly, I think, but I'm going to go show your variation now. So instead of king d6, h2, knight g3, mm -hmm. king f4, knight h1, king f3. Yeah. And now white's only idea is to play king d3. Yeah. King king e2 and then when black takes the knight you box in um black's king with king f2 so black's king is stalemated and still hold and, the draw huh and actually whoa is it a draw or does white win <laughs> let's see a5 if you yeah, take it stalemate a draw. b5 b6 and black just plays a3 just ignores yep, the pawn. just ignores it they each get a queen I guess I should have put the king on f2 instead of f1 yeah, long ago. <laughs> Ray's like, yeah, that would be considerably better now. <laughs> now that you see what was coming. Yeah. So okay. It should still be a draw. Yeah, and should still should still have been a draw. Okay, cool. So, um, so the game was drawn. Let's get back to our top boards. Uh, Bao Chi Lin has built up what looks like a very scary buildup on the king side to me. Uh, playing for the Chengdu Pandas as international master Bao Chi Lin. Um, and uh, his Pandas have a 12-point lead at the moment. It's pretty near decisive. Um, 
Let's see. I mean, this game looks interesting and tense to me. Yeah, this this came from London. Yeah, this looks like a, a London structure, except a little bit unusual that the bishop eventually got to h4. And it's kind of stuck over there, but black doesn't really have a way to to attack it. So a lot of pieces in strange positions, like black's queen is on g7. Uh, Fiend shadowed queen, you don't usually don't usually see that. Not usually a good sign, but um, but it doesn't look too bad. After white's last move, rook f e one might might be considering some sacrifices on on e six. I mean, Ezra's last move was a five, so it looks like he didn't see any direct threats from White just yet, and he wanted to play b four and start to make some progress on the queen side himself. Um, I guess long term, Black often has good chances in these structures, but it is hard to hold the whole king side. I mean, it feels like the white pieces are overall a bit more active than the black pieces. Whoa. <laughs> Ray, you didn't like that. Your face said you didn't like that. Uh, it was uh, it was unexpected, but I yeah I have I have got the feeling that it shouldn't be good. Like, what if White takes Knight takes F six, okay. and then there's gonna be like F takes E five and forks. He decides just to take on E five immediately, mm -hmm. which also seemed oh, really also, good. But but what would have happened if Knight takes F six? Okay. We can find out for you. Knight f6. Um, I assume knight takes f6, as you said. Then f takes e5. Uh, maybe knight takes on e5. And okay, then white can well, take with the knight. Uh, They're up a pawn, and they've opened the e-file, which is great for them. And every Yeah, that's amazing. Um, maybe... Hmm. I don't know. After knight takes f6, there there could be rook takes f6. Maybe after knight e5, knight e5, I can play g5 for black. Um, yeah, you can. But in takes e5, white still could have taken d takes e5 also. Okay, then I want to go bishop c5 check. Mm -hmm. King g2. If you block with the knight, I might still have g5, perhaps. So let's say king g2, and then I'm moving this knight to g4 and hoping that white has something loose. Or can I go to e4 even? Yeah, I think maybe knight e4. Knight e4? Knight e4 makes some sense. I don't know if it's if it's fully working or not, but yeah, I mean it's still yeah, it still it wasn't completely clear, but I mean he made the White made the decision very quickly. He took on e5 almost immediately. Yeah. I I know I would have spent like two and a half minutes thinking and then gotten down to the increment <laughs> yeah i mean the white the way white played it is super complicated i mean black has this move g5 at any point right and white's gonna have to sack a piece mm -hmm. um for example i mean i don't know what knight f5 was about but the position right before knight f5 was g5 not a candidate already yeah, g5 is always a candidate okay. now. As you mentioned, the, the bishop is stuck. So g5, um, yeah, actually, what what is the idea for white? Um, for a second, I thought you could try, like, knight takes g5, f takes g5, bishop takes h7, and if queen takes h7, it, it loses the queen, I thought, because rook takes f8, removes the guard, but that rook on c7 is actually still protecting the queen on h7. Mm-hmm. Um, so G5 there, I don't know, it looks pretty good. Um, <laughs> also, you could, you could have taken the, the knight on F3 first and then played G5, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that also seems like a peace winning continuation, right? So, oh yeah, I, I feel like. So Bao chose this position and Ezra didn't go for any version of G5, not clear why it wouldn't be amazing for him to do so. Um, I don't I don't know what's going on either well, <laughs> in this position as well. He's still stuck, so he might he still might get in G five. Um, I mean he could still like he could still play G five even here, couldn't he? <clears throat> Maybe that's probably an important question. Oh, wait, I think he just did. Did he just do it? 
Yes. It was right under my mouse. So again, I, I had to be sure. Did he do it or did I do it? Okay, so he has gone for g5. Um, it looks like f5 is sufficiently defended. c4 is sufficiently defended. Uh, I don't know what white was doing. Yeah, I think um, I think after e5, this um, the decision to take on e5 was just a mistake. He probably had to go for the knight. Takes f6 line um, because once he got rid of his f4 pawn, then that bishop on h4 it was already stuck, but at least the f4 pawn prevented g5. Once that pawn disappeared, there's <laughs> that bishop was just resigned to uh, to its fate. Um, probably, as we said, he could have gone for g5 earlier, but even even now, it looks like he's still going to win that bishop. So now, knight c4, self-forking, maybe sacking yeah, another self bishop, right? After b takes c4? Oh, he's, he's taking an f5 at least, but yeah, after right. black just takes back, um, I mean, maybe he'll try queen b6 with the idea of g takes h4, there's rook takes f5, but... Oh, yeah. But that that bishop is still stuck. There should be there should definitely be a way to like a move like bishop e four or something. Um, just getting rid of the dangling bishop. Oh so yeah, he played rook c six and now queen b five. So white's still hitting the rook. The idea is that white's still threatening rook takes f five. But yeah, now maybe move the bishop. Um, Yeah, bishop e4 is probably probably fine. And now if uh, if white tries something like rook takes e4, d takes e4, bishop takes g5, mm -hmm. f5, queen g5 check, we always have this nice rook. Um, rook. It's not really a rook lift, but the rook just swings over to g6 right. and uh, stops it. Stops it's, it's doing something. The pandas now have 30 points. I have to assume that that means they've won the match. Um, uh, so that means that they'll tie St. Louis for first place with nine points. Um, regardless of how this comes out, I'm pretty sure. So they'll be tied for first place with nine points, followed by uh, San Francisco getting no points this week. So they'll still have uh, five and San Diego with one. But uh, we'll watch we'll watch these games to their con conclusion. Um this the line that we, we mentioned actually did happen the, the sacrifice on E4 and G five and then rook G six and black is completely winning. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. I didn't I wasn't keeping up with it for a second, but yeah. All this happened. Black's got an extra rook, so that looks very comfortable. It looks like Ezra will get one nice win today. And uh, let's see. What else should I click over to? Oh, there's one other game that still looks quite interesting that we could click over to between Art Vega and NK123. Okay, I I see it. Yeah, this looks pretty interesting to me. Um, like positionally, White has a protected pass pawn and a bishop pair, but then King safety is also a, a positional factor in a sense. Oh, sorry, Bauchilin just resigned, so that was as we expected that game going to Ezra. But the White King is like just I don't see the solution to his situation just yet. Yeah, knight b5 is, um, well, it makes a lot of sense trying to just get rid of that bishop, which is dominating that whole, I mean, it was in a very nice place in the center, but from the yeah. center, it was controlling so many squares, preventing white from castling kingside, and white doesn't really want to castle queenside. Um, black was always possibly could take on c3 so knight b5 trying to get rid of that bishop um one thing he has to watch out for is bishop takes b2 mm -hmm. and you can't take back because knight d3 forks the king and the queen yeah so b2 he has to just move his rook somewhere um 
But I mean, probably the way I had to go for this because he, he really need to get rid of that that bishop on d4. So maybe bishop b2, he'll just play something like rook d1, controlling d3. Now he's threatening the bishop and and hopefully he'll at least get to castle in the next few moves. Yeah, ideally trade off the bishop and castle, right? Like yeah. some version of bishop d4, knight takes bishop, e takes d4, and then castle. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that occurred to me that black could be considering here, other than bishop takes b2, would be a rook to e8. Is that reasonable? Yeah, so you're just you're just preventing knight takes d4. Um, yeah. Yeah, rook. Let's say rook f e8. Okay. Could I mean? White could cons like now it's more feasible that White could try to castle queenside. Um, not that he'd be super happy about it, but White could maybe try to castle now, and then threaten um, knight takes d4 and moving the queen away. But uh, NK123 decided to go for bishop takes b2 in the end. Okay, so he did do that. And rook d1 was played, as he suggested, for Art Vega. Uh, let's see, which of them won the first game between them? NK123 won their first game earlier. Um, so, so Art Vega, he's got the white pieces here. He's now down a pawn after sacking the b2 pawn, but there is this queen takes b2. It is super complicated. See what his chances are for revenge here. I, f I could see him being better even down a pawn if his king were like on h2. Mm -hmm. If like the king weren't a problem. Yeah, no, I mean, I think objectively black is still doing pretty, pretty well, mm -hmm. um, but he's also down to about a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely going to be the random speed factor as well as the objective evaluation. So bishop d4 is a move. Um, even a6 is is an idea just to, to hit the knight. He's gone for e4. Whoa. So he, uh, Intense. Well, he's, he's really trying to go for this forcing line queen b2. Yeah. If not queen b2, then, I mean, I guess castle maybe was an option, but white, white was not worried, I guess. Queen b2, knight d3 check is his idea. Yep. Take, and now, now again, white's not going to be able to castle, but white did win just win material. Right. So black is playing solely for the initiative, playing for like rookie 8 check and rookie 2. And rookie 2. Mm -hmm. Trying to take advantage of white's weakened uh well he hopes weak king oh i like the idea of throwing that move in for white i mean i haven't calculated it but mm -hmm. the bishop on g5 was kind of out of things otherwise so it seems nice to trade that off before going for a move like queen d4 or bishop f3 or whatever it is he's planning to to defend with next well bishop f3 queen e3 is not playable <laughs> queen d4 queen d4 is is a move um then if rookie eight check, where were you intending to move the I king? was feeling like I was forced to go to D1 to not allow like rookie two with check. Um, but maybe king F2 is playable too. I'm not sure actually. Yeah, I think you could go king F2 if rookie two check. <laughs> Even king F3 looks possible. Oh, let's see what's happened. Queen D4 has been played, rookie eight, king F2. Okay, so that's all on the board. So he'll probably play rookie two, and then yeah, he'll ha he has to choose. Can he even go king g one, or does he have to go king f three? King g one, then there's d two, and then king h two. But yeah, king f king f three. Then queen d four, knight d four, rookie one at the end, right? Yeah, I mean, why would have to try to put his bishop on f three to oh, stop? Bishop f three could stop it for a little bit, yeah. Huh. But now, yeah, now after king f3, rookie 8, that was the, the move I was worried about for white. Not exchanging, that would give white a tempo. The knight would come to d4, hitting the rook. So he's telling white, you can exchange if you want to, but mm -hmm. I'm not going to give you extra tempo. Now the rook is coming to e3. So this was the issue with king f3. 
Mm -hmm. He's going to trade queens. And then if rook e3, king f4, and black can't take on g2 yet. So I think white still has a couple moves he could play here, right? Between like rook d1 and knight d4. There must be some move that's still playable. Oh, knight d4. Um, yeah. Rook d1 also. Okay. Because the rook is hanging, so... Yeah, probably white just... Scrapes, white just survived everything. scrapes by and wins, probably. I mean, if they weren't in the you know 20 seconds each scenario. But now black's time is ticking down as he struggles to find something to keep the tension. Okay. So we'd expect bishop f3. Ooh, d6. Oh, he's trying to put a nail in the coffin. Ooh, and rook takes d3 coming. And now what? Bishop b7 is a good square for that bishop to hide on. Um, I feel like white's looking for moves like knight d6, but this was pretty... Yeah pretty sane to just oh, do this oh no h5 and rook e2 you have to be you have to watch out yeah I well he's thinking uh, a long time for a position with one legal move I g4 i think okay yeah. found g4 found g4 anything can happen when you just got a couple seconds you can freak out and not find it take the g pawn i think it's another attacking piece if you leave it there oh, and he hung his rope so that's probably the end of that i think it was over anyway white had uh had successfully <laughs> handled a very those positions are really hard to handle when you're the one with with uh just a few seconds and and your king's getting chased around can um can we go back to move 29 really quickly and and look at one line yeah um or i played d6 yeah um, just threatening d7 but also giving up his bishop on g2 so black played king of eight to stop to stop the pawn with his king, but there was uh, just a funny line. If black played rook takes g2, white plays a d7, yeah. and there's no way to actually stop that pawn. So black needs to go for checkmate. So he can try rook f2 check. Okay. Forcing king g4, h5 check, king yeah. h3, rook e2. So basically the same thing he tried to do in the game. Um, white queens with check. Yep. King g7, and now black's threatening rook h2. <laughs> so now we're doing the and, whole thing as black down a queen. And if g4, as white played in the game now, you just play a rook to the third rank and it's checkmate. So there's actually Ouch. there's only one defense as far as I can see, which is rook h1, the only defense. Um, and since black doesn't really have any pieces besides the rook, there's there's nothing which can be added to the attack, so that Can't defense would be more. tough, but... Um, Okay. It's just a, a nice mating pattern to know about. That's very nice and very close to checkmate. And I imagine if black played h5 before rook f2, white would have had a way out as well with g4 in some version. I mean, with it, queening with check first, but... Or rook d3 to f3, yeah. A million ways to win that. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, super cool. So, everybody, we're going to... Um, we're going to be signing off in a second and passing you on to James Canty. Before we do, we're going to load up uh, the current standings for you, so you can see. Um, so you can see where where things are at. Uh, in this in this uh, division now, uh, with St. Louis and Chengdu. Uh, jumping into a tied first place. The tie breaks are currently with the St. Louis Archbishops because the tie breaks in, uh, in this league are also how many uh, fans there are in your fan club. And St. Louis currently has the most, even though the Pandas gained one more than them this week, uh, which was nice for them. But St. Louis still just barely has the tie breaks over the Pandas if they scored the same number of points next week. And then the surfers with just uh, with just one point. I mean, Derek did a good job winning his uh, his second match in the knockout in his debut for his Pro Chess League debut. But uh, one point is still not enough for them to be able to get catch up 
with one of the nine point teams next week. So there's no way the max you can get in a week is six point. There's there's no way for the surfers to catch uh, a top two spot in the division at this point. And the mechanics would need like a really big week next week to pass Chengdu or the archbishops. Um, and basically this is super important because the top two teams go to the uh, summer series championships at the end of the season. Um, there will be two other teams that will get voted in, I think, by Twitter, two third-place teams. So you guys will all have a say in which team you want to see in the championships at the end of the season. Um, and uh, Chengdu and St. Louis with huge fan clubs obviously would have a good chance of getting in by fan vote, even if San Francisco passed them somehow next week. But for now, they're sort of justifying their fans by just taking the top two places off of their own chess play. Um, so, uh, I think, uh, that's, that's all the action for now. James Canty is going to be going over viewer games, um, from this match, um, and fan games from this match in the post-match show. And, uh, Ray, you think you want to be back to commentate again sometime? Um, yeah, <laughs> sometime. Uh, it was, it was definitely interesting for me. Thanks for for <laughs> being the host and helping me out a lot. Um, yeah, if, if anyone enjoyed it at all, um, I would, I'd be happy to come back sometime for sure. Cool. Well, it was, uh, it was an honor to uh, work with you for the first time and to have a, such a strong player on our stream. And uh, yeah, thanks everybody for participating. Remember the top fan prize. Remember to uh to participate you know even between weeks you've played your games but now let's uh let's learn something from the games we've played and uh with that we will pass you off to james canty who will gladly help you with the learning process <laughs>